to get my timer set. Um, so thanks, I, th thanks Anne, and uh, for putting the conference together. This this presentations have been great this morning, which actually stresses me out um, a little bit. But I think each one of them was really very good. So um, I hope I can can follow along, and I look forward to the the conversation after. So I'll be focusing on. Um, a couple different things. I hope I tie it well enough together. A little bit about data, trying to focus on big data, or maybe what I uh, will define as big data. And then I'll, I'll end with some examples from the FDA Sentinel project that, that Patrick referenced, um, focusing on uh, the pediatric population. So I added my disclosures this morning. I'm an employee of Harvard Pilgrim, and I get funding from a lot of different places. Um, uh, so there we go. Uh, I'm surprised I didn't see this this morning, although maybe I missed it. I went and copied it from, uh, it's an IBM uh, uh, slide. Um, Rob Califf kind of got at it this morning when he was talking about the different kinds of data. But I think if we're thinking big data, and we've touched on all of these things. I mean, the, the uh, presentation about the inpatient data uh, was, I mean, Talk about velocity, right? Um, so, but this is, these are the constructs that I want us to think about if we're thinking through these problems. I'm not quite sure that I deal with big data every day, but volume, just size, scale. Um, millions of people, billions of people, I don't know what's really big. Um, velocity, it's coming through every second. So I don't know, so I've got, a, I got one of these, I started to put it back on, right? So if 100 million people have that, that's volume, but if it's got my blood pressure or something every second, that's velocity, right? So you start to think about, well, then in the back of your mind, think, what am I gonna do with all of that? Um, Variety, well, I have this information, but I also have data at my phone, which is where I've been today. My phone knows everywhere I go, and it knows if I'm going to a good restaurant with good quality high food, or I'm going to McDonald's or somewhere else. Um, so my phone has a lot of information, and of course, there's my information at my medical providers, but as, as Rob Califf mentioned, you're not actually seeing your doctor very often. Most of what you're doing is somewhere else. So, uh, and veracity, which I think we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, can you trust any of this? So if I do this a lot, then am I exercising? Um, it might look like I am. Uh, if I put it on my dog, and my dog's running around, and I win a bet with my wife about more steps this week. Um, but that's just one person, and it probably washes out. Um, but that's the kind of stuff that, and I didn't do that. Um, I would never. You put it on a fan. Um, <laughs> and then, right. Uh, so uh, this was, actually, I didn't look at the date. So a couple years ago, this was, I'm um, talking about Sentinel, and I'll talk a little bit more, and big data has rendered fit and functional. And it, it was nice to see this. I think we'll, it's, that's the hope, but this was, it was an early assessment of what was going on with FDA's and Sentinel project that I'll, I'll talk a little bit about. Um, Sentinel's charge, this was very specific. I'm just gonna go right to the speedily. Um, FDA uh, was required, as, as Rob mentioned this morning, it's nice when Congress says, thou shall do something. Um, Congress said, thou shall create a network. And so FDA had to do it, which actually was incredibly um, liberating because it wasn't about spending five or 10 years thinking about what to do. There was a date in the law that said you have to be ready on a day. And it really focuses your attention on doing something to get it going and focusing on getting something working right away. Um, so FDA was given this charge to assess the safety, effectiveness, regulated products, uh, and to do it quickly, meaning, uh, I'll use speedily two ways. To do it quickly, meaning get the, syst the system up and running quickly, but then when FDA asks a question of the Sentinel system, to be able to answer quickly. So it's actually two different things. Uh, I borrowed this slide from, I think actually David Martin, um, and this actually starts to get at some of what uh, Patrick was talking about, and we've talked about it earlier, and I'm not gonna focus so much on the text, but is does big data help us get at some of the biases that we see in any individual data system? I don't know the answer to that, but maybe if you're getting a little, if your information's a little bit broader, you can start dealing with some of the biases that we know exist, uh, and that we always, the epidemiologists are always trying to deal with. Uh, so I'm gonna shift focus a little bit 
um, getting a little bit more operational. So what's really needed to generate actionable evidence? It's, I hate to say it, and I really I want to be cautiously optimistic today. Um, it's really easy to generate outcomes. It's really easy to generate numbers, um, statistics, whatever we want to call them, insights, whatever they might be. Um, but is it actionable? So um, to get actionable information, you need adequate data. So can I find, in, in this context, can I find the right exposure? Can I find the outcome? Can I find the covariates? Can I find the cohort of interest? Um, if it's kids and you only need a, uh, age to find a cohort of interest, well, that's pretty easy. But if it's also some other condition, maybe it's not. Um, appropriate method, you have to match the method to the data uh, or you'll get you'll get junk. Um, and then you have to have those to answer the question of interest at the level of the right level of precision. Some questions don't need a level of the same level of precision that others do. Maybe I'll just I'll leave it at that. Um, so you have to match all those things in order to generate actionable information. Um, so I made this stuff up t uh, a couple days ago. I was thinking about what's unique about kids. Uh, so um, I'm not exactly sure. There, there has to be, and there's some, and I'll, I'll point those out, but age by itself doesn't make it unique in the, in the data systems, right? If you have a date of birth, you're pretty good. Some of our systems only have a year, and then you actually can't do some things that you could do in other systems. So if you only have a year of birth, then you, you're kind of in trouble. Issues around exposure during pregnancy is actually the one that really jumps out at me, right? So exposures uh, during pregnancy and birth outcomes now, um, that's clearly uh, an issue for in pediatrics, and it's actually pretty hard to deal with. Um, well, I'll show a little bit about a study uh, that we did focusing on this, but it's actually not that easy to link a mom and a kid. In, claims database, in EHR data, basically anywhere. It's, it's not as simple as you would expect. And then all of a sudden, it's hard to do some of the, some of the work that we uh, wish we could. Um, even the information that happens right after birth, some data systems are going to confuse the mom and the baby. <laughs> and that's, you just, and it's not, I might say this a few times, that's not a problem with the data. If you make that mistake, it's user error. I'm pointing your finger at myself. If I make a mistake and think that after birth and I see a birth outcome, but it's associated to the mom and I didn't pick it up, that's, that's me not understanding the data. And that's user error versus the data system. You have to, if you understand how data are collected, you can use it. If you're not focused on it, then you'll have trouble. Um, this is what I'm really, I would love to do some work in this, in this area. Are there unique patterns of care for kids that might make it a little more difficult. So I don't know. Um, do kids end up, we certainly know that there's hospitalization and there's a birth, and then the kid goes to a pediatrician and the mom goes back to every clinician they are seeing, and those data will never see each other again, likely. Uh, but are there unique patterns of care with kids where they might see more specialists and end up a little bit more dispersed data than, than adults? It's possible. I don't, I don't know. I'd actually like to, to look through those. Um, uh, and do they get care at school? We won't see that if they're getting any care at school. And some kids get a lot of care at school. Um, we, uh, this was a different problem. And obviously, there's the regulatory issues that you deal with in research and with, with minors. Um, but we tried to do a study, and this was years ago. And this might, oh, yeah, it might be 10 years ago. But it was vaccination in adolescence. So it was actually Minactra. Um, so we've published on this. but. The problem is the vaccination's given right before you go to college. And then you don't know where the kid is. You don't know who's insurer it will be or even what EHR system because they're vaccinated right before they leave or they get to college and say you're not allowed to go to class until you get vaccinated. And so it actually was really hard. Even in that, it's a very unique situation, but it was hard to do. Uh, and um, we ended up finding some way to do the study. I don't know if anyone believed it, but. Um, uh, but we did. So I just wanted to draw us back to um, the, those first four, the four Vs of volume, veracity, variety, um, velocity. So I think we hit all these, I'm calling them, eh, I don't know if they're big data. I won't call them problems. These aren't big data problems. These are just constructs that you have to think about. Um, and I wanted to think about it, uh, particularly in pediatrics. <clears throat> 
So uh, I'm going to shift and talk a little bit about uh, the Sentinel uh, initiative that uh, that we are that I sit at the operations center for. So Sentinel is a big organ. It's a big collaboration. I think there's 30 or so partnerships within Sentinel. Um, it's a distributed network in support of FDA. This is an FDA. Uh, it's an FDA system. It's funded by FDA. We are the prime contractor, and then we have these partnerships, and we have a uh, uh, we have a mission and a requirement to fulfill the needs of FDA when they call to ask us to do a, do assessments using the data sources that we have access to. So it's a distributed network. So the quick version of the distributed network, the data, there's no big central data warehouse. All the data sit with the partners that are responsible for managing it and protecting it. Um, it maximizes local control of the data. We share as little as uh, possible when we're doing our analyses. So you always share minimum necessary. That's actually a requirement. You're always supposed to share minimum necessary. Um, and we take it to an extreme. Um, local experts actually know the data have to be involved. We think that's incredibly important. Um, and then uh, these last couple we touched on today, but we want the study protocol to be implemented identically. Um, we need su to support standardized reusable components and tools, and it's this idea of actionable information. So if you're going to do this, Patrick, I described uh, a common data model already. So Sentinel uses a common data model. We have 17 data partners. We use, uh, they all transform the data to a common data model, and that's what we use. Um, I'm going to say, just pause here for a second. When, when we were building this network, we actually we built it, I think, pretty thoughtfully from the beginning, meaning we spend a lot of time thinking about it before we went into it, and one of the key pieces was there's a strong coordinating center with very active partners who uh, are data partners. Our data partners have a very strong voice uh, in how we designed the network, so there's a strong coordinating center, um, and we had, we decided on a common data model. The, the data had to be uh, comparable in format and meaning. Meaning is really important, uh, not just the same format, because uh, 100 can mean a lot of things. Um, but is it a weight or a height, and is it in pounds or is it in centimeters, right? So, um, and this is what I think sometimes people don't want to hear, is um, the big data needs big curation and big expertise. Um, it's, databases are easy to get at, but, you know, I, I think I've been using this example for 10 years or so. I mean, you can prove with very tight confidence interval that high-dose Lipitor causes heart attacks. That's just the wrong method, you know, but you'll see that relationship really clearly. It's just you didn't, you didn't ask the question properly. But um, if you gave it to some kids or uh, really anyone, <laughs> uh, that's the answer you get. It would be very clear, actually. Um, but that's just using the data incorrectly. Um, just take a look at this for a second. This is the... Um, this is real. These are from. This is in the Sentinel network. This is what we found for platelet counts. There's only one possible unit for platelet count, um, but this is what you find in the actual data out in the real world. So this is what you have to do, and I'm not quite sure what an automated program is going to do if you send it out to a world that looks like that. If you test that program at your site, and your site uses one of these 60 or so result units, or maybe even five, and you assume that the rest of the world uses those, you'll find, you'll get an answer. It just will be ignoring all the others. This is hard to deal with, and this is, the, this is what you actually have to deal with in these networks. Um, HbA1c doesn't look any different. Um, this is what it really looks like. And in order to work in a distributed network, you have to deal with this. That's why I'm talking about these idea of big data, big curation, big expertise. Because you can get lots of data and lots of lab results, but if that's what it looks like, you're going to have a lot of trouble dealing with it. Um, even worse, you won't know you had to deal with it, and you'll just get an answer. Um, so uh, for the sake of time, I'll just kind of highlight these. I'll just focus really maybe on the second, the, the wordy bullet. I remember 10 years ago de, um, writing it and debating it with all of our partners. Um, the focus here on the Sentinel data model was that it had to be understandable and intuitive to the epidemiologist. The epidemiologists were the ones who were asking the question. They're the ones who were going to call. 
and it had to be understandable to them. So it was, this was a big, it was important, it's why we had so many, we, we took so many words for it. Um, there's a couple other things that Sentinel does, which is we, we don't map data if we don't have to, we don't create derived variables if we don't have to. Um, you leave the data in the form it exists at the source site. That was the idea, and there's very few examples, there are a couple where we're doing any kind of mapping um, in format. So you leave it at its raw, at the raw level. If I see it in this database, I see the same exact thing in the source data. That was the idea. Um, so this doesn't, this isn't exactly um, getting at known or unknown unknowns, um, which was NASA. NASA used that uh, first, um, and then the intelligence community and some others. Um, but inclusion of a variable doesn't mean it's complete. Completeness is going to vary over source and time. In any of these distributed networks, this is true in Sentinel, um, availability in the source data doesn't mean it's actually usable. Um, if you understand how the data are collected in the source system, you might make a simple determination of there's no way I'm going near that, um, uh, especially in a multi-site environment. I'll give a quick example. I think I, eh, we're OK. Um, uh, maintaining standardization, actually keeping a network up and running is an awful lot of work. It is, you can't do it once, you have to keep going. Um, I will give this example because it's two clinicians that I fully trust at two different very elite systems, healthcare systems. One said to me, our problem list is absolutely perfect. It's gold, it is our source of all truth. It was not an exact quote, but it was pretty close. Another colleague said, never ever trust the problem list in my system. No one ever changes it. Right, so imagine doing work in a distributed environment if you don't know that those two things are, they're both true, but it makes it really hard to do the work. I don't want to be depressing about it, but that's the reality that we have to face. Um, so I'm going to skip through some of the data model pieces. So Sentinel has a data model. Um, it is uh, pretty simple. I'm not going to go into detail here, but it's claims data and EHR data, and then we add to it as we need. Um, so we just pulled in a big EHR hospital system because uh, FDA wanted access to um, uh, information during a hospitalization and a level of granularity that we didn't have, so we bring in another system. So it's extensible. You can kind of just keep adding to it, but it was focused uh, on need, and then you build. Um, the database is big, and there's billions of dispensings, and um, uh, again, it's all distributed. Uh, so there's actually no data sitting uh, in my group uh, back in Boston. The uh, How do we get at the... Uh, how do we answer questions within the system? There's really three ways we do it. You can write a piece of code or we build tools. We mostly use the tools now. So we have tools that you can answer pretty routine kinds of epi questions uh, pretty quickly is how I think about it. But I'll, I'll give some examples, so I'm going to go a little faster. Um, I talked a little bit about data uh, quality. All of, our data, all of the data in the Sentinel systems updated, I think quarterly is, is really the, the cycle, and they're refreshing the entire database every quarter, and we are checking it every quarter, every time they do it. So that's this construct of a strong coordinating center. Um, we have different kinds of level checks, uh, or checks that we do. Um, it is very common for our very sophisticated partners to fail a check and have to redo the work. There's a lot of reasons for it, um, but it happens all the time, and this is 16 times we've had to our partners had to redo their check in just since the beginning of this year. This is eight years or so into the process of doing this. It's not the first time they've done these, and they still have to redo it because we're identifying problems that need to be fixed. Um, so how do we actually work through the system? Um, I'm just going to go through this quick. Um, our distributed network, we send out queries to our network partners. We use PopMedNet, which is just a piece of software to do it. They execute the programs locally, identically. We send one program out. It runs the same everywhere, creates information, whatever the data sets are, or the result sets, it creates them, sends them, uh, then our partners uh, send them back to us through PopMedNet. We download them, aggregate them, create reports, and hand them to FDA. 
So that's how the Sentinel system works. It's also how Pacor Net works, and it's also how several of the other networks uh, that, that we would operate. Um, so I'm going to quickly go through um, just some evidence generation. So this was uh, a study that was published a few years ago. Uh, I'm trying to talk about evidence generation, actionable evidence generation, for comma, actionable. Uh, so this led to a label change. So that's a New England Journal article in test deception after rotavirus. This was a full epi study. This was not send out a program and get an answer. This was a full epi study with chart reviews. Um, but it, that's what you need in order to get the information to uh, at the level of precision that was required. That's what you do in a study like this. So that's an example of matching the the needs to the study design to the data. We did chart reviews. It took a while. It wasn't cheap. But that's what you need to do. Um, uh, I'm going to talk a quickly about this. Uh, this is described as vaccine use during pregnancy. Think of it as any medical product used during pregnancy. Vaccine's a great example, and this was a CBER uh, project, so they were focused on vaccines. Um, but what were we thinking about? First, outcomes uh, after maternal vaccination or vaccine during, uh, during pregnancy. How are we going to actually handle this mother-infant linkage? And it's not new. We know how to do these, but you have to kind of do them new every time. And then to think about a claims-based algorithm for uh, gestational age, the systems actually don't have a beginning of pregnancy. The date really doesn't exist. It certainly doesn't exist in a claims database. And it exists in probably 50 different places in an EHR. Uh, but it's probably not labeled as that. Or it's in a note somewhere. right? So it's actually not that. And that's straightforward. When you do this work, you end up with things like moms and kids in the same database. And some of them are linked, but then there's some kids with no moms and some moms with no kids, but you know they had a kid. Um, and then we have the State Department of Public Health that has a birth registry or, or a birth certificate data. And you can try to use those as well. Um, so this is how you try to do some linkages. Uh, if you're working within a system, I'll just go back for a sec, um, you can use subscriber IDs. And if you we don't know what the subscriber ID systems look like, but our partners do. So our partners do that work to figure out the subscriber IDs. Um, and you can use last names, or you can do a linkage. It turns out if you just go to our partners that are the ones who know their data best, you get about 80% link between mom and kid. Adding the birth registry didn't actually help. It took a long time, and it's probably expensive, but it didn't really get you anything. And about 20%, you just actually don't get that linkage. Um, there's lots of reasons for that. That doesn't mean it's wrong. Um, they, there's a lot of reason they wouldn't be in the same system. Uh, we did this validation study because we're trying to figure out, well, does our validation of the beginning of pregnancy work? And it works pretty well. Uh, this is you know, one week or two week. Uh, this is based on a chart review. So what would the algorithm look like and what did the charts look like? Um, so I'll skip to this, I don't know if millions or hundreds of thousands are big or small. So this was just, I wanted to identify this construct of longitudinality. Um, so this is also posted, all of this stuff, so I should have mentioned the last one was presented at ICP last month. So it's posted online. Um, all of this stuff is posted online. Um, all the reports are. The, so this was a question that we were asked, find people, uh, find HPV vaccination, and then look to see how much time you had in the data for them after that vaccination. So there are a lot of different analyses. I pulled one really small piece of it, um, so it could be big enough so we could see. But we had about 1.9 million um, people that are new HPV users that had a year's worth of information before. Now, this, is, this was using claims database, so we used enrollment to define that. And then we looked at, well, six months, 12 months, 24 months after. So 1.9 million new users with a year pre. So that's how you can look at um, previous conditions and six months post. So if your study is looking at an outcome three months after vaccination or six months after vaccination, that's what you're looking for. If you're looking for a longer term outcome, well, you'll have fewer people. Um, so about a million people with a year before and two years after, and about uh, 570,000 had three years of post-exposure and one year pre. I have no idea whether 570,000 is big or small. That might be really exciting or not enough. Um, probably depends on the topic, but you have to. But it is a construct that is important to be thinking about when you're thinking about these data, because I could have a lot of information for people, but if it's really cross-sectional, you can't. 
you can't do as much as you could do if you had longitudinality. So you have to just be thinking about the use cases. Um, there are two, uh, I'm just have two examples of studies of uh, medication use during pregnancy. This was uh, recently published by FDA. This was um, antiemetic use. And my eyes are so bad, I, this is the one I need. Um, so this was uh, use of this medication. There was concern that the med was being used during pregnancy. It is not indicated for nausea. I think it's nausea vomiting during pregnancy is the terminology. Um, so on, on, death, on Dancitron is not indicated for use. We wanted, FDA was interested because they thought it was actually being used. I don't know how they had that in their head. Um, so this was a simple way of seeing that. The, what's the conclusion? The conclusion is we might need to do a little investigation into the use of this medication during pregnancy because docs are clearly using it. Um, right? So if this didn't show that trend, then maybe it's not, uh, maybe it's not an issue, or maybe it's a different drug. But uh, this is a pretty simple way. This is very quick. This is actually pretty quick and easy to get at this kind of information. Um, same kind of idea. This is um, Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices when it uh, was suggesting Tdap uh, vaccinations um, among uh, unvaccinated women and then among all women during pregnancy, and you can just see a trend there. This is pretty simple stuff, but it's a really easy use of these data that you want to be able to get at quickly. Do I have something I want to worry about? Or maybe this is just, hey, it looked like that recommendation is it's actually happening. Uh, so again, is 39% really good? or Where's the other 60? Um, so we'll see what happens. You can see what happens next year if it's tracking up or maybe it really has plateaued and then you, you make some decisions. Um, we were asked, these are another, this is just one more example. We were asked, um, I'm not quite sure how long ago, within the last year or so, uh, I need to know how many transfusions happen during, uh, during delivery. Uh, it's actually during pregnancy. Um, so we found about a million, sorry, almost two million deliveries, which was a pretty big portion of the, the deliveries in the US during that time. And about 1% had a blood transfusion. That was the answer that was a very clear question answer. It didn't need to be particularly precise. They wanted to know whether it was really close to zero or really close to five or really close to 10. They just kind of needed to know what they were facing to make, uh, then to go on and make some other decisions. This came in as a kind of red light urgent request. Um, so we got the data back uh, to FDA about three days after the final specifications. I don't know, half the room might think three days is an eternity, and half the room thinks three days is a miracle. <laughs> it's up to you to decide what that is. Um, it takes as long as it's going to take for the epidemiologists and the clinicians to make the decision on what I called here the specifications. That should not be rushed, and that's not a push of a button. But once you decide what you want to ask, we should be able to get answers pretty fast. So uh, I won't take a poll if you think it was fast or slow. Uh, so I'm going to end with this mobile app project, uh, and then we can get to the panel. I think we're pretty good on time. Um, so this is, I didn't mean to pause there. Um, uh, this is a project that's just about finishing up. Um, I'm saying it's just about finishing up. We're just really about starting to enroll uh, some patients. But this, uh, the funding source came from, really, it's the Cori Trust Fund money through ASPE to FDA. Uh, and then we're uh, developing the app in collaboration with FDA. It really is um, an FDA. The idea was that this would be the first of what could be many apps that came through the system. The idea here is, well, there's a lot of information that uh, you just don't have in any of the data systems you need to get from the patients. How do you get it from the patients? Well, everyone has a phone, right? It's obvious that the, the reasons you would do this. Our initial use case happened to be um, medication use during pregnancy and safety and, and enrolling pregnant women. Now, I was pretty much against that when I heard that that was because it was of all the sensitive cohorts to start with, right? Um, just imagine going through an IRB to try to get this through, which we went through three IRBs to get this through. Um, so we built an app to enroll uh, women uh, at a clinic uh, during their pregnancy for them to provide information along the way. So I'll go a little bit. So there's some screenshots from the app. The app's up in the Android store. I don't know if it's up in 
uh, Apple, it's up for Apple yet. There's a long debate about that. Um, so you create the app. Actually, creating the app is pretty straightforward. Enroll patients. Um, we're doing informed consent through the app, um, which we are happy to be able to do. So you enroll. When they're enrolling, we basically have a token that will link them to their health plan data. Our partnership, which I skipped over on the slide, is um, with Kaiser Permanente Washington. So that's where the patients are coming from. Kaiser Permanente Washington has a database of, you know, they have an EHR and a claim system, and we have to figure out how to enroll patients from there and then get the information from the app back linked to those data. So that's what we're doing. Um, you enroll them, engaging with them. You can ask them questions every day or every week, whatever, whatever you'd like to do. Um, we have it in a, in a very secure environment, um, means it's also very expensive. Uh, to do this, so the data from that app are sitting in a secure environment over in the corner, and then what we have to do is make sure that we can link the data that the women are providing through the app back to their health plan data and their EHR data. Basically, the point is you have to just be able to make the link. If we can prove that this can all work, the cycle will work, you can do it for anything. Uh, so that's what uh, we're doing. They've just started to enroll some patients. And uh, to think about the future, well, um, in Sentinel, we are incorporating a mom-baby linkage within the data model. So that's a new thing that we're just going to start. So it'll be there and ready for use, and it won't be ad hoc anymore. So then you have to build tools for it. But that mom-baby linkage, because it's such an important topic, we're just going to build it as core infrastructure uh, to do the work in the, going in the future. Um, can NLP help us? Um, I expect. And it, NLP should be able to help us, or other ways of getting at um, either information that's not in the data we have, or to be a little more precise or trusting the data that are there, but how to better use it. So there's lots of different things we can do there. Um, methods, um, better tools to use this dispersed data. The reality is, we're if you go all the way back to the beginning, data are, that we would probably like to use are not all sitting in the same place. So if I want data from my wrist and my phone and my health plan and all these other places to actually all be used together, that's methods development. That is actually some, it's hard to do, not just technically, but the regulation, just to think through how to do that is, um, it will take some time. There's clearly ways of doing it, but it'll take some time. Uh, and we have some examples here of distributed, even distributed regression, um, vertically and horizontally distributed regressions. Um, I don't quite know how to handle the velocity problem. I look forward to, you know, what do I do when there's a blood pressure every second? I don't think you need it, unless you're in the hospital and actually you need to see a spike or something, but, but do you need that for a comparative effectiveness study or a safety study, right? So don't collect it if you don't. Um, so think through those things, because the, just because you could, it's there, doesn't mean you, uh, you should be using it. Um, and clearly, uh, uh, we can't forget about research methods, right? Just because there's data around doesn't mean that uh, you can ignore having proper methods and thinking about your comparator. Every time you ask a question, you're asking something very specific. Does drug A have a safety? Is the rate of, I'll go back to Patrick, because he said I would use angioedema, so now I will. Right at the end, the, what's the rate of angioedema, drug A compared to drug B? That's the question. And if you change drug B to drug C, you've asked a different question. And you can't forget that. And if you have it drug A to 1,000 drugs, you've asked 1,000 questions. So um, we can't ignore the research methods when we have access to all these data. Um, sorry for taking a little bit long, but thanks. Thanks, Dr. Brown. So um, everybody on panel one can come up to the front of the room. <laughs>
press this. Okay. Thank you, everyone, uh, for coming up for the panel and for all your great talks. I just wanted to uh, say that Bob Davis was going to be here today and is sick. And um, I'm sitting in for him, um, directing traffic a little bit here at the panel. So um, he is from the University of Tennessee, and we miss him. But uh, we'll make do. Um, also on the panel are um, Michael Blum, who is a um, currently a deputy director, Office of Pharmacovigilance and Epidemiology in the CEDAR Office of Surveillance and Epidemiology at the FDA. There he is. And uh, Dr. Carolyn McCloskey is a medical officer epidemiologist in the Division of Epidemiology 1, Office of Pharmacovigilance and Epidemiology, Office of Surveillance and Epidemiology, CEDAR FDA. And she is right here. Okay, great. So I, you can see um, projected the questions we're going to, we have four questions for each panel, and I thought that maybe the thing to do would be to talk among the panel members for the first five or so minutes uh, about a given question, and then open it to the audience for another five or so minutes. So uh, why don't we see how it goes? Um, the first question is, given the current state of the art in pharmacoepidemiology and big data research, what types of questions can we answer? Let's just start with that. What types of questions can we answer, given the current state of pharmacoepi and big data? So I'll open it up to the panel members. I'm willing to go for, whoop, sorry, I, and I can abstain, right? <laughs> so we have an abstain button. Because so, um, um, this is, I, it's, I'll say, an awful lot and very little. Um, so this is really what we do every day is get questions of, can I answer this in your system? Um, so if you're thinking about particular systems, it's the, 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 the process we go through is, can you find the exposure? Is it in the data or not? If it's vitamin use, it's not there. It's not going to be in a claims database. It may or may not be in an EHR data. OK, let's just assume it's in an EHR database. OK, well, where is it? Well, it's written in text. OK, well, are you willing to go and find it at 100 places because it's written in text? That's another question. So can you find the exposure? Can be, does it exist? And are you willing to get it? Uh, can you find the outcome? Is it, if, what is the outcome? If the outcome is you know, lost days from school, it's not there. Uh, but other outcomes will be. Hospitalizations will likely be there. Uh, and then you have to ask whether there's important, we think of it as there are important confounders or cohorts of interest, stratifiers even. If you, you know, race, other things, if it's critical to that question, can you find it or not? And I you basically just go down the list. Um, so if you think about all the questions possible, yeah, not a lot. But actually, I think the data can support much more than what you're using it for uh, right now. So, Thank so, you. I, so I laid out that, um, at least within Odyssey, we're focused on clinical characterization, population level effect estimation, and patient level prediction. I would actually assert clinical characterization is where there's the most low-hanging fruit, particularly as it relates to pediatrics research. Um, I know that Miriam had a nice paper published that basically just tried to summarize how much drugs are being used by kids. And it is not rocket science, and yet I think it's the only paper that actually bothers to provide an answer to that simple question. Um, and the fact that we don't know what kids are taking which drugs, we don't know how long they're taking them for or what dose they're given for, the fact that we don't know very simple things that really are just descriptive characterizations suggests to me that, that um, the, the lowest of the low-hanging fruit could be in the characterization space. Uh, Jeff provided several examples where they've done just simple descriptive characterizations that actually was actionable, um, and, and we've done the same. 
I think uh, rather than trying to make an a, a assertion of that we can answer all characterization questions, we should get on with trying to enumerate the questions we want to answer and then try to get as much evidence as we can. But certainly, very simple descriptive stuff seems to be very powerful because we don't have nearly as much visibility into the real world as we think we do. I'll say a few words. I'm, I'm, the, uh, I'm Josh Denny. I'm from Vanderbilt. I'm the, the other new member up here. The, um, you know, I think there's one class of data that we haven't talked a lot about this morning that relates is, is genetic information as well that is, you know, um, linked with uh, a, a um, breadth of data in a number of large cohorts. And the other category I'd bring up would be um, sort of there's this breadth and depth. And if you think about the depth of, of, you know, the EHR data into text gives you a different character of the types of questions you can answer. I would think both of those add different characters to the types of data and questions you can answer. And also, to some degree, the certainty of which um, you think about the, re -ans the answers that you get. When you think about looking at notes, you know, when, when you validate an a algorithm, as Jeff talked about, about date of pregnancy, you're going back to the notes. Well, in some cases, you could actually build an algorithm primarily to analyze the notes and get performance characteristics good enough that then that be can become a computable attribute um, as opposed to using proxies around um, uh, using uh, codes and things like that. And so we think a lot about, you know, how, how you can build those kinds of features in. Um, and then when you think about genetic data, you know, it sort of becomes a, a you don't have to, if, if you have it, you don't have the, um, uh, the absence of evidence uh, being evident, you know, evidence of absence is, is sort of a different problem because it can be a known assessor that's before the exposures. But I think when you do the association statistics, there is a lot of concern about the things you find. I'd like to address the second question within this question, if that's okay. Sure. Okay, but first I should say I have no disclosures and my, these opinions are my own and not necessarily those of the FDA. Um, a critical question that we still cannot answer well has to do with patient reported outcomes and it ties into uh, Jeff's uh, discussion of uh, mobile apps and patient reported outcomes are not well captured in claims data or electronic health records. So we need to look for other sources of patient reported outcomes, including novel applications like the mobile one, but also registries, surveys, uh, and dare I say social media. So. Does anyone else have an, um, something on the question of what types of questions can, be, can we still not answer and how can we get closer to answering them? So maybe I can, I can add uh, a bit just about the first part and also just about the second part. I think that now, um, you know, I think we have a great opportunity, especially with, uh, um, with, with really the big data domain becoming more and more pervasive wherever we go. That means that now wherever you look for, whether it be um, organizations like Facebook or Google or Apple or so on, each of them, even Fitbit, for instance, each of them have their own APIs that now allow you to directly request data or engage end users and, and request for, for data. So rather than, I think one of the presentations earlier talked about passive versus active, and now I think there really is an, opti uh, 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 an, an, an option for us to become more active in, in how we gather and collect data. So really it's, it dri it's now driven more by questions that we want to ask rather than the availability of data. I think that makes it more potent and more um, accessible to, to, to find out new answers that we just weren't, weren't able to identify before. Um, I might add that um, overarching all of this, that the studies need to be well designed, even though we're dealing with big data and different sources of this big data, we still come back to the basic epi problems of well designed studies and you need to consider the confounders and the biases. And also to remember that um, these studies are not necessarily designed to prove causation, but like many have mentioned, we look at different databases and we get different uh, outcomes, or different results, I mean. So I'm hearing that both to the question of uh, what types of questions we can answer and to the 
question of what types of questions we still cannot answer, I'm hearing that it's important to think of the questions and think of questions that are um, answerable with a given database. I think um, a couple of people brought up the idea of you know, different databases giving you different answers and then bringing in social media, you know, um, and you think of like, you know, patients like me and sites like that that are collecting patient reported symptoms in a broad scale, but not necessarily a systematic uh, approach. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, you can add, I guess you can go through an approach of what is your question and what is the methodology to, um, to, to get at that question and then and derive that data or also just gather the data and then try to see what it can answer. And as long as you divide, devise good uh, study designs and then test them against outcomes you're expected to find and, and have a, um, a lot of circumspection as you look at the data, you know, you could find new things with it. And I guess, you know, different people have different biases. This is kind of different, you know, halves of the room kind of uh, question. But I think it's an important one as we start to get the big data because we recognize those problems within existing data sets that we understand, not to mention all the other data sets that, you know, the APIs that Facebook and others have that we could be getting into. Maybe I'll open it up to the audience. Um, uh, Bill Cooper, Vanderbilt. Um, Pat, you talked a lot about sort of the notion of sort of these what seem to be falsely precise narrow confidence intervals. And Jeff, you were commenting on the need for methodologies. When we think then about th looking at across large populations and bringing these huge data sets together, what, what are the types of methodologic studies? What kind of things do we need to to be thinking about as we as we move forward and applying these, and what and what have we learned from other fields? I mean, certainly the the where they've done with all these large data sets in genetics and pharmacogenomics. So, uh, where do we need to go in terms of some of those studies? I'll I'll highlight at least one example um, in in an adjacent in a literally adjacent domain. Um, so the machine learning community is solving a purely predictive problem. It's pure inference. They're not doing causality at all. And yet what's interesting is that the machine learning community has very quickly adopted a pretty disciplined approach that not everybody follows. But in general, there's the notion that you have to do internal validation, which is usually performed by like a test, uh, test train split of the data, and external validation, meaning you need to show that your model that you've learned in one place can apply and achieve adequate performance in another place. And performance is quantified based on a model's ability to predict a given outcome. Um, to a large extent, the causal inference space and what we're doing in population level estimation, we're trying to get relative risks or hazard ratios, and we try to think our way out of the sources of bias. But we don't actually have nearly as rigorous eva empirical evaluation metrics that we consistently apply within our studies. There has been some areas where, for example, there have been folks that have advocated for the use of, of negative controls as a way to at least perform a diagnostic to see whether or not your study has bias. But by and large, as a community, we are not very disciplined about performing diagnostics and empirical validations of the results, even though in the machine learning community, it's kind of like you can't get in the door if you're not doing those things. And so I think that's at least one area that I would point to where, where even though they're solving, I'd argue, maybe a slightly simpler problem, because it's inference, not causal inference, they're, they're bringing a level of more rigor to it that I think we could learn from. Uh, AJ Allen from uh, Eli Lilly and Company. Um, so I've been involved over the last few years in some, some safety analyses where we've used big data, but I've also been uh, more recently active in some things where I've gotten involved with bioethics. And I've actually been a little bit, there's a tension here that hasn't really been touched on, um, which I think is you know, a concern we need to have some at least recognition of. That has to do with the fact there's a lot of potential out there with big data. 
the more precise the data is, the more useful it tends to be because you can look into a variety of relationships and that, the more you can hook up to additional databases to link the, the data sets and bring in new information, the more useful that is. That also has the, the increases the risk of uh, to the individual patient privacy in that. It, it creates more opportunities for someone to essentially either via, via a direct linkage come in and, and connect to the data or via a uh, inferential method, essentially create a fingerprint based on, say, visits to your doctor, the uh, lab values that come in over a certain period of time, et cetera, that could, could uh, um, allow a person to be you know, identified. It's very difficult to eliminate all of those things in terms of de-identifying the data and, and uh, such. Um, and people are concerned about these things. If you look at uh, like the Pew Trust uh, surveys, uh, I think healthcare data is the number two concern that is out there in terms of, of data privacy. Um, so, you know, we have, the, there is this tension and I guess, you know, one of the things people are, yes, people are interested in, in taking advantage of data to learn about side effects and things like that, but they're very concerned about these issues. And if anyone has any doubts about that, you have Equifax a couple of weeks ago to remind you of just how much of a concern that is. Um, so, you know, I guess I'd, I'd just be interested in comments about how much those issues are coming into and are challenges for this uh, type of big data work you're talking about. So maybe I can I can start. Uh, I mean it, that that is an incredible problem in the machine learning community. Um, it's an incredible problem because, especially as we start to collect more and more data, and and as we start to collect sensor data, there's some school of thought that potentially sensor data can be identifiable that different individuals, their age, their gender, and then their resting heart rate, and all of now you just know exactly who you're talking about. Um, in our in our case, what we've actually done um, to to and we have put quite an emphasis on that um, with uh, with the Oak Ridge National Lab, we've built a dedicated tunnel from the university to the to, to the the analytics center where we have uh, where we we are sending data and analyzing that, and soon we'll have a HIPAA compliant data. Uh, center that is uh, kept in the Oak Ridge National Lab, which will which will be available for identifiable data to be sent and analyzed and retrieved. But that's an exception, I think, that that many others uh, really um, um, would not would not follow. Really, HIPAA compliant data centers are I, I haven't come across any um, in my experience. So. It's a big problem. I think it's going to get even bigger as we start to collect more data and um, and it's an expensive problem. Right. Uh, <laughs> that, that way you can talk first. I did want to hear what you were doing. Um, so it's a great question, and it's, it's one, it's, a hu it's, it's clearly a huge issue, and it's, it's why we created a distributed network, um, because no one would give their data to a central site, and we didn't want to ask. And, and in fact, we didn't want to, so I'm sitting at a coordinating center, I didn't want to have responsibility for someone else's data. So I didn't even want it in-house. Um, so I think some of the methods that we've, uh, kind of two approaches here. I skipped over one of a piece of one of my last slides, which was horizontally and vertically distributed regression. You can now do, um, run a regression that gets you the right answer without putting all the data together. So the horizontally distributed regression, we've got nice presentations and even, uh, I think even a YouTube video showing it. So it's using the data as if it were all together um, and you get the right risk estimate. Um, sorry, I, I, that's a horrible thing to say with Patrick <laughs> next to me, a risk estimate. Um, so, uh, so there's a new, that's methodology and there's vertically partitioned data which is actually much harder to deal with where the data for one person sits in two institutions it's technically possible to do, and we're working on that as well, but that's why are we doing all these, jumping through all these hoops, so we don't bring all the data together. And I think um, there's a lot to be said, or there, I think there's a lot of opportunity for I'm um, just gonna term just-in-time information. So you often don't need very much in order to do your work. So imagine a study where it's starting in the inpatient setting, and you want to know if someone had some outcome a year after they were discharged. Well, you can't use that EHR system 
because it doesn't, it won't know if you went back to Maine and had a hospitalization. But all you really need is a yes, no, from this date to this date, were they in the hospital? And the answer is just a one or a zero. Uh, so that's what I mean by just getting the information you need. So if we can figure out ways of doing that and saying, here are my 100 people, here's the date, and I want you to just tell me yes, no, whether you see a hospitalization for that person. Uh, so that you can try to, then you're not moving as much information around, but you're still getting what you really need. Um, it's hard to do them, but we can build systems to do that uh, kind of relatively quickly if we can create the relationships to do it. Okay. I think we're going to take this, this question here, and um, then we're going to move on to the next, to the next question, next panel question. Uh, I'm Ed Tabor from Fresenius Cobby. Uh, I wanted to address the issue of what questions we still cannot answer. And in this morning's session, I think it was Dr. Karana, uh, suggested that we might be able to shorten the time from the approval of a drug with an adult indication, an indication for adult use, and the approval with an indication for pediatric use of the same drug by use of big data. And uh, I'd just like to point out that I don't think that's going to be possible because uh, if you're going to use big data as opposed to uh, experimental clinical trials, uh, you're going to only be looking at off-label use if it's been approved for an adult indication and not for a pediatric indication. So that probably will not shorten that interval. Or, uh, do you think it's possible to look at off-label use in, in vehicles such as Sentinel? So if, if the concern is that the use will, by definition, be off-label and therefore an unusual cohort, then that, that's by definition I can't handle. That's just the way it will be. If, it's, um, if we're willing to accept that off-label use among kids in the data is, um, is actionable, then the data are there. Um, so I, think, I, think, I think what, what Anne but, is saying, and it's a good way of looking at it, if, if we had a product that was approved for adult use and <clears throat> some pediatricians were using it for um, the same indic or a close indication in children, would it show up in Sentinel? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. So maybe it would, maybe it would yeah. be possible then. Yeah, yeah. the data, the, the exposures and the outcomes, they, those will all be there. You won't have a, I'm using it for X indication, um, but the information certainly there. I'm sorry, yeah. what is it you won't have? Um, so what you don't have in a, in a claims environment, and actually unlikely to be trustworthy in any environment, is I'm prescribing this for this indication. It might be scribbled in some note, but it's not going to be electronic. Ignoring that, um, but Josh has a way of getting it out of this, the system. So, uh, but yeah, if it's a drug exposure in a child that's an off-label use, that will still be there. Okay, great. I'd like to go on to question two, uh, which is, what are some approaches to validating big data? And how do these approaches differ based on the strength of evidence needed in different settings, in other words? Strength of evidence needed in various different settings. I'll, t I'll take the first go at this. So I think one of the things um, we often think about is looking at orthogonal classes of information. The, um, and then there's also kind of the chart review component of this. If we think about a lot of the electronic health record based work that we've done at our institution and across other institutions, um, uh, oftentimes in multiple sites we have um, a subset go back to the, the charts to validate that they really have the diseases and the timelines that we think they have. Um, and a lot of times, uh, you know, there are big problems. I mean, we can do a really good job for saying yes or no, someone has a disease given certain uh, components of codes, labs, meds, things like that, lab, um, and, uh, uh, you know, text mining, uh, NLP, uh, different components. But if you want to say, you know, did an event happen while you were on that drug and 
does it look like that you know med is a potentially causative agent for that drug i.e they weren't already in the icu and 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 that's you know had lo low blood pressure from their sepsis that caused their kidneys to um, uh, to have misfunction. And, and so those kinds of questions are much harder. Uh, when we looked at uh, clopidogrel um, adverse cardiovascular outcomes after stenting, for instance, our initial algorithm uh, was only 60% correct. Um, and, uh, and typically, we're, that same kind of algorithm for a disease indication will be 95 plus percent correct. So in terms of orthogonal classes of information, looking at um, uh, crossing, that's one of the reasons I mentioned genetics, you can look at sort of genetic associations with outcomes and look at their effect sizes as you would, for instance, against a um, exposure. Um, and uh, uh, if you, you can mimic um, uh, the effect of a drug by that blocks a certain drug target by the loss of function mutations in that gene um, and look for those outcomes and also those side effects um, potential with an opposite direction of effect as the indication. If you look at those kinds of studies, uh, broadly Mendelian randomization studies, as, as something that you can use in concert with sort of epidemiological studies, I think um, uh, you can uh, gather information from both and combine them. Um, one, you have huge numbers on. Um, the other, you may have lower effect sizes in some cases, or some cases higher effect sizes. But I think uh, together they would add more information. And I think you know all the work that Patrick and Jeff showed, looking at many different sites, is another aspect I think that is really strong at adding uh, validation. So I'll just I want to draw one delineation. I think that there's a need to think about data validation. And um, you know, both what we're doing in Odyssey, what Jeff showed with it in Sentinel, we put a lot of effort into data validation. So actually evaluating data once it's in a, uh, one, when it's moving into a common data model and when you're extracting out. The second component though, which is different, is the, e, the evidence evaluation. So even after we've done all, the, all we can to understand data, there is still measurement error. You know, even in the, the absolute perfectly cleaned claims database, there will still be people who got drugs that just weren't in the system or you know the diagnosis codes were just misrecorded and so that represents measurement error as a community we're not really um we're not really uh, f uh, don't have a consensus with how we formally uh, encapsulate that measurement error into our our evidence um, however when we think about e e validating our evidence we want to know that if we're doing a prediction model, we want to know that we have high discrimination and in calibration. If we're doing a causal effect estimate, we want to know that we get an unbiased estimator. If we're doing characterization, we just want to know that the, the rate of an incidence of a, an event is, is what it should be. And I think we should be thinking about validation procedures both on the front end when the data is coming in as well as what are the appropriate diagnostics we should be reporting out whenever we perform any analysis. Anyone else? Maybe I can add a little bit to that. Uh, so one of the one of the things that we one of the challenges that we face is once you have certain models and methods that are built, um, taking that and applying that in similar but different environments, um, like um, was mentioned right now, measurement errors. You have devices, multiple devices, and each of them are generating the same signal ECGs but using different algorithms so how do you how do you combine all of them together and what what sort of errors are introduced when different devices are, are sending you uh, signals so especially as you start to gather more and more data becoming more uh, informed about where that data comes from is even more important Okay, great. So is there anyone from the audience that would like to address this question? What are some approaches to validating big data? And how do these approaches differ based on the strength of evidence needed? So I'm just thinking about what we mean by based on the strength of evidence needed. Um, I mean, one thing that we would be thinking about is regulatory decision making, and another might be um, clinical practice. Um, and I don't know whether whether the way the data would be validated would vary based on those two kinds of 
uh, situations in which you were using the data? So, uh, let me try. Uh, so one of the things we, we often see in, um, in vaccine safety, so I'm not a vaccine safety researcher, but I know a bunch of them, and um, they validate every outcome. Uh, when it's vaccine safety in kids, and there's 20, and what I mean by validate every outcome is they go grab the chart and a thoughtful person reads it and then they give it to someone else who also reads it and then we see if they got to the same answer and if they don't, we go to the third person who reads it, right? So, um, so why would we go through that effort? Because that's so important. It was need, it's needed for that if, um, so when we did that Manactra study um, and it was Guillain-Barre syndrome is what we were looking for and you know there were 400 charts and we went and I think we found 700 and then we, I think we found 700 cases and went and found the 400 charts all around the country. It was probably at 400 different hospitals um, to validate it because we couldn't risk it being wrong um, of those outcomes. So that was just a requirement of that question where for most uh, studies we use these data for, we don't go and do that, right? So I think that's trying to, and that's the use of the data, I suppose, the use of the question or who's using it for a regulatory decision. Are you going to take a vac is, you know, vaccines are really effective. So yeah, but if they're causing something, you got to really know about it. Um, so I think that's, uh, and that's how, what I was thinking about as you were as asking that question. And that's, um, we do it rarely, but you do it in certain situations and then you, it, it's a requirement. It's always done. Regulatory situations. Uh, yeah, those are all regulatory. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ed Tabor, Fresenius Cobby. Uh, just to ask for a, uh, to split your question further, Ann. Um, uh, I think I've seen a situation where FDA would accept this type of study or data from this type of study uh, for um, meeting PREA requirements. But I'm wondering if FDA would, ex and if perhaps it's division by division, but whether FDA would accept data from a study like this as an, one of the adequate and well-controlled studies to meet the, uh, uh, the basic uh, evidence of safety and efficacy for approval of a drug? Well, I, I certainly can't answer that. Um, <laughs> well, I didn't really expect you to, but yeah. I just... <laughs> I still wonder. But it's, it's definitely an important question. Um, you know, it, it, it depends. Um, Miriam Sterkebaum, Utrecht University Medical Center. Um, I was hesitating to come up here because I think this is a really important question and I wish I could give an answer, but the only one, it's a question that was addressed also at the uh, last meeting of the International Society of Pharmacopedemiology. So the question I think where we as community are really struggling is when do we know something is fit for purpose and can we actually have a quantifier around it because then we would maybe feel more certain or something and I don't think it's actually uh, there yet. Um, I think this is a field that we are starting to explore and I, I think we can approach it a bit from a benefit-risk approach. So what is the benefit of getting more precision or getting more certainty against the risk if you have it wrong? Um, and I think that is where the decision-making actually may, may alter. So for a regulatory decision, it, do you really need to know the exact answer? And then you may need one to validate or is it better to actually have quick answer. So it's always a trade-off between going fast and having the right quality against cost. And you always have to somehow trade off between them. That's what I've learned so far. But I guess we don't know the answer yet um, exactly. We would want to quantify this and have a better framework, but, but it's not there. Not that I've come around, actually, for all type of decision problems. Does anyone want to comment? I'll, I'll just add to Miriam's, Miriam's comment. We, we have to be careful about being concerned about getting the perfect evidence where we need to look at where we are. And specifically within pediatric research, for almost every, everything we've got, we have a complete absence of evidence. So when we think about the trade-off of a doctor gets nothing or a doctor gets a piece of information that might not be perfect, I'll choose the piece of evidence that might not be perfect. Um, you know, 
uh, last year when, when, when my child was born, I was given these drugs and I had to make a decision to, to whether or not to give them to her. And I had no information about these so-called fatal adverse reactions that could happen. And all I needed to know was, is it, is it one in 10 or one in a million? That's the difference between not taking the drug and taking the drug. And we don't provide that evidence. And this is, this is across all products, but I think you know, specifically for pediatric research, we need to like start somewhere. And I, I, would, I personally, I can't speak for um, uh, what's going to be a regulatory standard, but just as, as a patient, I would really, really like for there to be evidence out there that could inform my own decision making, even if it's not good enough to get published into science or nature. I think um, I'll just add one of the things I, I think that we should think about or I mean I think you have led into is the different kinds of data sets we have for doing these kinds of evaluation in kids. Um, are really, it really is different between kids and adults. If you look at our large academic medical centers often feel like we do have a, a large cohort of patients that um, and on the adult side that we uh, really have almost all the data on and so these you know, purely EHR based networks will provide, you know, uh, a lot of depth and breadth on the large population. And I, I think when you think about the pediatric case, we do a lot more subspecialty care. The academic hospitals do a lot more subspecialty care. And the pediatricians tend to be more distinct, distributed across the network and don't necessarily have the same common reporting in. Now, I'm saying this as an internist. So, so you know, Bill's probably going to vehemently disagree with me. No, he's, he's, he's giving me a thumbs up that, that he agrees. That's good. Um, uh, uh, you know, but uh, I, I think that that's a fundamental difference. You know, when we talked about some of the indication problems, it, Fortunately, the care of kids is, is, um, uh, it tends to not have you know, lots of meds and lots of concurrent diseases. That's not true in all cases, of course. But um, uh, that does make some of these analyses easier um, once we start aggregating data. The problem is we just want to have a robust collection of data. And that's where I think you know, efforts that actually get at claims data for kids is very important. Alison? Yeah, if we've, if we've got time, it'd be, uh, when we talk about data validation, I think that means different things to different people. And if I think about quality of data, I may think about how much missing data is there, how accurate is the data, how representative is it, or how complete is it? And all those are different problems for different questions. But I wonder if you could. Both, both Patrick and Jeff, give us an idea on what you mean when you say data validation. This will be fun. Um, so, <laughs> thanks, Alison. So you're exactly right. I because to me it almost doesn't mean it, it, it's so complicated. It doesn't mean anything in particular, right? I talked about validating a particular outcome, but that's really different than validating a database or a piece of a database. Um, so. And I think, I'm gonna turn the question around a little bit. I think we blame the data too much and don't put enough responsibility on the users of the data. Uh, so, you know, in a data system, we know from 45 years of work that an outpatient diagnosis in a claims database doesn't mean anything. It just doesn't. In a claims environment, it's not audited. It just doesn't mean very much. If you use that code and infer information from it, you've made a mistake. Um, not the, it's not a problem with the data, it's a problem with our understanding the data. It's a totally different question of an outpatient procedure code in a claims environment in the United States is very meaningful. It dictates payment. And if you get it wrong, you're, it's actually fraud. So that code really you can use, but the diagnosis code you can't really use by itself. One, a single diagnosis code of diabetes in the outpatient setting does not mean you have diabetes. It really doesn't, probably doesn't mean very much at all. Um, so, but if we use it to infer diabetes for that patient, is that the data's fault or our fault? Uh, so that's maybe a slightly different version of the validation because we can't, the data are there. It's, it's been recorded when you go and, um, boy, I get stories. I should probably ask Josh for stories about how the EHRs work in different systems. But I have a colleague that I, go, that I talk to about every three months, and he shows me EHR implementations and workflows. Well, there are systems that you cannot get a chest x-ray 
unless there's a diagnosis code input in the system. Well, what's the most common one? One, 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 one. It doesn't have to be a valid code for that condition, but the problem is one, 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 one is a code. And so is zero, one, two, three, four, five. Zero, one, two, three, right? Those are codes and people put them in in order to get to the next screen. Um, and if you don't know that, so that's what was put in the system. The most common di the most common smoking status at one of the prestigious hospitals in Boston is indeterminate. Indeterminate means I forgot to ask because I was really busy doing other stuff, but I can't get to the next screen unless I do something. So <laughs> indeterminate is the most common smoking status. And so all the clinicians will tell you that because they can't get to the next screen. Um, so, but is that valid data or how do you validate it? So that's where I'm struggling with it, right? It's what is in the system. We have to figure out how to better use it or not. Uh, I hope okay. that gets close, but it's, I'm struggling with it. Okay, great, thanks. And Patrick, I think you were asked to answer this question, but can you do it briefly? I'll do it, I'll do it very briefly. One of the things that um, Jeff and I have actually worked on together is thinking about data quality from the perspective of both validation checks, meaning like rules that you would want to fire, but also just data characterization. I just simply want to expose the user of the data to what is in the data. And so very often it's not about fixing something, it's about notifying the user about what things are going on. If there is a fix and it makes sense, then we want to get the data research ready so an analyst doesn't need to know that, that's great. But very oftentimes what we simply need to do is expose the users of the data to, these are realities in the data that are inconvenient and you should think about how to incorporate those, those issues into your analysis. Great, thanks. Um, let's go on to question three. Um, does the strength of evidence needed to make regulatory decisions change in moving from traditional randomized controlled trials to pragmatic studies using big data sources? Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I interpret pragmatic in this, in this question to broadly to include um, non-randomized observational trials, but there are some who interpret it very narrowly as just meaning pragmatic randomized control trials. So I've taken a broad view. Um, strength of evidence is most important in demonstrating if and how an intervention works. But what's also important is the applicability and the generalizability of the results, and that's where uh, pragmatic and observational trials really add value. Um, so the bottom line is not all questions can be answered by traditional randomized controlled trials, and observational studies can produce robust evidence uh, and th that'll enable you to make causal inference, uh, provided though that the quality is adequate and an appropriate control's been selected. Um, the other thing is that consistency of results across multiple uh, independent data sets really adds stronger evidence um, to the, um, to the uh, regulatory decision that needs to be made. Caroline, do you have a, any comments? He pretty, he pretty much covered um, what I was thinking other than that uh, if you can do the randomized controlled trial, do them. If you can't, you're relying on what you have left. Um, and then, like he said, extrapolate from other studies, but also confirm with other studies. And I would also add that we're sort of in this new world where we're starting to really care about long-term data. And randomized control trials often don't give us data on the long term. So I think we need to be thinking also about how can we get information, whether it be different from randomized control trials or not, that will give us some idea about long term safety and efficacy. Hi, I'm Harry Sachs from the Division of Pediatric Maternal Health, also at the FDA. These are views of my own as well. Um, very, very good presentations and discussion. 
you know, I think one of the challenges, I mean, one of the cool things about where we are in space right now is that we're actually talking about using data we have. You know, when I first came to FDA, there was no data on kids, really. I, you know, I'd call my friend and say, hey, what dose of blah, blah, blah do I use to treat hypertension? But now we actually are studying it, and that's what's pretty cool. So I think you have, we have two opportunities, which is you know, using the data we have from the trials, but also now using the data that are in these systems. And as you all pointed out, there's some weaknesses in the systems that we need to know about. I mean, as a pediatrician, if I write a diagnosis of ankylpresis, I don't get paid. But if I write constipation with soiling, I get paid. And so you know, that, like you said, getting the diagnosis very hard to use, right? But many of the things that we're collecting, we may be able to use. And what seems like is the most powerful is what you all were talking about, some of the low-hanging fruit of what's typical, OK? You know, if I have patients with high blood pressure, what's typical? What am I seeing? You know, what are the norms? You know, how can I use this data to look at you know, my population of pediatric diabetics and you know, see what happens over time with A1C or whatever it might be? And that's what we're going to need to focus on and use that. And I think as we get data on what's typical, then we also can probably generate data that may be used to help extrapolate efficacy, as we were talking about, or gets long-term safety. But you know, I think we're going to need to really look closely at what's typical. And in order to do that well, we're going to have to make sure what we're collecting is very standardized. Go ahead. Uh, it's kind of building on what Patrick said. So I completely agree. It's actually pretty easy <laughs> to figure out some of these just basic parameters of just the basic clinical characteristics or the data of, do kids use this medication? That, that, that kind of yes, no answer is very easy to get. Is it, is it changing over time? Is it a problem? I know that I get called a fair amount from my friends in industry who have been asked by FDA to do a study in pediatrics, and they say, well, I don't think any kids actually take my drug, but I'm supposed to do a clinical trial. But we could find out whether kids actually take the drugs pretty, pretty easily. Um, and then, so I don't know what the topics are, which drugs. You could do it for every drug, right? And just, is it, is it being used and by who? And then you can make some decisions of what, what actually what needs to be studied or, or maybe what can't be studied. Um, I mean, I've, we've done, we've looked at the entire it won't be the entire Sentinel database, a big portion of it, and found 25 people, 25 kids exposed to the product. And you know, there's unlikely to be a study there, and there's certainly unlikely to be a clinical trial that would be done in that cohort. And let's like, find those out quick. Um, and that's all, I, I would, I'll call it even easy to do that. I'll just add one thing. Um, I feel like this is like a love fest or something, Jeff. So, so Jeff, you had on your slide the, the thing that you're not sure how uh, clinical practice for peds is different. Um, I know for one of our exercises in Odyssey, we were we took a population of diabetics and we just asked like, what happens to the people right before they get their diagnosis, and what happens to them right afterwards? And when we looked in the peds net uh, effort, the the kids that were diabetics were just wildly different in terms of what the what the docs were doing. Um, for example, like when and how they were even getting tested, like were they getting an HbA1c and when, uh, how to disentangle the type 1 and type 2 thing. It was a wildly different uh, set of behaviors. And I think all too often as it relates to pediatrics, we, we start with the assumption that we hope it's the same as adults until proven otherwise. And I kind of feel like we could use this characterization to start with the assumption that kids are different until we prove that we can, we can learn something from the adults. Okay, sorry. I think we should go on to the question four. Oh, sorry. No, no problem. I, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was only to maybe add to your question and also coming back to a question you had earlier. I, I think data have to be fit for purpose. And one purpose I would see, I think industry and, and everybody is complaining that drugs are, pediatrics drugs are, 
approved years and years and years after the adult drugs. And I would think this kind of real world data would maybe not pivotal evidence to, to approve a drug, but they may obviously very supportive in shorten the time gap. Because if, if I would see, or maybe an agency would see, that you have a high off-label use with, without any really associated safety issue, you may come to the conclusion that the, the clinical study might be smaller and, and not powered for, if for safety or something like this, shorten the time to approval of that drug tremendously while then going on in, in a registry to look at the long-term safety thing. So I think that is where, where I would see the need or, or, the, or the benefits of, of this kind of data. So, so not uh, replacing it completely, but uh, adding it on top of, of really randomized studies. Do a smaller randomized study and look, for, look before and maybe afterwards on, on the real world evidence you have to inform safety or possible safety risks you, you may imagine on it. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so I'm struggling with something. In um, studies, pediatric studies under an IND, there are often going to be multiple cross-reference INDs with biomarkers and other studies. Post, let's say, a decision at the FDA to extend that indication, how do you merge those data addressing the intellectual property issues or what might be proprietary data? Uh, what is the mechanism for doing that, either through academ academia, the NIH? How can we partner across institutional barriers to enable that? And I'm thinking in particular, eventually, as children progress through their developmental milestones for either adding or deleting black box warnings. That's an example of how the data could be needed over time and looking at epigenetic changes. I, you know, I'm looking for some sort of advice. So you're saying a, a bunch of data are being collected in a bunch of different places. Right. How for, does it the, get all analyzed together, and how does it, intellectual property issues, how does it come together? After the FDA makes a decision whether to extend, an let's say, to extend the indication, what do the partners of the people who have held these INDs do to get beyond those intellectual property issues and barriers mm -hmm. to pull the data yeah. and then continue following the children through adolescence and young adulthood? I don't have a good answer to that. I mean, I, but that doesn't mean that it's not very important. I think it is. I just don't have the answer. I, I don't know if anyone in the audience has thoughts about that or anyone in the panel. I can only tell you what we're thinking about, you know, as a possibility uh, for the future would be if you have a data set that is, um, uh, you know, open but has identifiers available to be accessed to it, but is could be potentially de-identified. Um, uh, something we do at our, our institution, for instance, this model is used to have a large de-identified resource, and uh, if someone has another data set and, and they want to see, uh, you know, if there are individuals in that data set um, or they want to look at outcomes from that data set or something like that, you can you know, basically pull the data in with the identifiers. You can create you know, sort of uh, a linkage of that data into the other data set or pull the data set out in you know, privacy preserving ways by hashing up the identifiers and things like that. The same thing, same way a lot of these networks actually you know, do uh, deduplication of records you can do to pull data together. I have no idea what the regulatory laws and stuff are around, uh, 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 around uh, uh, clinical trials data. Um, but uh, if it had to reside at, say, Pfizer, you could imagine I probably shouldn't set a name, but whatever. The, um, uh, it, it, um, uh, uh, it, uh, you could link in data, and there are ways to do that in privacy in certain ways and maybe give them an enclave. OK, great. Let's go on to question four. Um, how actionable are the results stemming from the analysis of big data? Um, I 
would like to hear from some of the people, uh, actually, Adam, <laughs> who hasn't actually talked yet? Yeah, I've, I've been a little quiet here, haven't I? Um, <laughs> partially, yeah, partially because I've been so delighted to hear the other answers coming. And also, a lot of these questions haven't been very controversial, so I've agreed with a lot of what's been said, which is great. Um, but yeah, to answer this question, I mean, I think this is, again, kind of one of these vague questions, right? It's kind of related to the strength of evidence, right? How actionable are the results? I think it depends on how certain are we of those results, right? And I think that's something that we're still as a community struggling with. How do we actually accurately report uncertainty? How do we accurately report, um, you know, I think for clinical trials, there's a pretty well-established methodology for how accurate things need to be. And I think for big data, there isn't. And so I think really until those standards are kind of agreed upon by, uh, whether it's places like the FDA or, or other places, uh, I think it's a little bit hard to, to answer this question. Um, so that's at least my uh, initial response. Anyone have any better ideas? Well, so I'll ask, I'll ask a follow-up question for you, Adam. So you were pretty clear with your two apps that you showed that those are, you've done research to develop novel visualizations and you were clear that that's what it was. If someone were to come to you from the FDA and say, okay, we got to push those into practice, do you think that the, the technologies and the tools that you've developed, um, uh, do you feel sufficiently confident that they're evoking the correct kind of information such that any actions taken would be proper? Or do we st would, you, would you push back to say there's more we need to do until we get to that point of confidence in, in make, taking action? Yeah, that's a really good question. And in, in my case, you know, that's not necessarily about validating the data, but rather validating kind of the interpretation of the data, right? Uh, and that's something that, you know, we do kind of, you know, maybe you can compare this to, you know, the randomized controlled uh, clinical trials, but we do kind of, you know, controlled user studies where we see how people kind of use these tools and respond. And that gets you some information, but it's usually not that valuable. And so we also do kind of long-term case studies where people actually use this these tools over a long period of time and see how they make decisions or not. But it's really hard to measure kind of uh, insights and, and things like that. And so it's really kind of so I would argue that you know analyzing how tools like this are being used is even immature than analyzing how you know uh, data is used. So um, so yeah, there's a the, it's one of my key research questions that I try to answer. But I would say that uh, to be honest, no, I would say no, it's not quite ready. We need some more experience, and that's really what we're trying to do. Um, yeah. I'd like to try to answer the question from a regulatory standpoint. I, 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 would, I would contend that FDA has been using big data for regulatory decisions for many years with respect to the safety of marketed products. Um, in fact, Sentinel, the Sentinel network's been fully integrated into our uh, FDA post-marketing uh, uh, pharmacovigilance processes. So there are some new areas, though, and several of you brought up uh, the use of real world evidence for effectiveness. And I know the subject of this meeting is safety, but I did want to make everyone aware that under the um, US 21st Century Cures Act, there, uh, the FDA it needs to develop a framework for the use of real world evidence to demonstrate effectiveness. And effectiveness to either fulfill a post-marketing requirement or for new labeling, which could include a new indication. So it's it's particularly timely in terms of pediatric data and the use of real-world evidence in pediatric populations. Um, but I know that that would take much longer than a two-day meeting to <laughs> discuss. Um, I did want to point out, though, that the substantial evidence, the legal definition, applies to effectiveness, but it does not apply to safety. And that's because you need to take action sooner with regard to safety, even if you have limited evidence in order to avoid harm. That's a good point. Uh, Mark Turner, Liverpool. Can I just answer this question by echoing what Miriam said? which is maybe actionable depends upon how fit for purpose the data is. And is it worth taking a proactive approach as you design the studies, working out what the benefits and risks are going to be so you can then mitigate the risks in your design and analysis. And then that balance then informs the actionableness of it. So it's maybe just taking a, 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 a whole, whole, whole study approach to, to quality. 
So I might I might add that with um, with with new tools like deep learning and um, and more advanced machine learning methods, that the um, the idea of actionable um, results is actually it's I feel it's a little closer. Um, in that there there is there is various levels of validation that are that are performed as part of the machine learning pipeline, but also uh, in that once we've generated models based on significant amount of examples and cases, um, that uh, and we're sufficiently confident in our models that those models can easily be be uh, used for um, you know in an actionable setting. So I, I think that. From an ML point of view, uh, big data makes it a lot easier for us to to have actionable results. Um, I'm a pediatrician and a parent, and I've learned a lot today from this morning's uh, efforts. Almost every one of you has said, we are doing this, and it makes me, in my naive world, wonder who the we is and how accessible all these results are to the average patient and the average pediatrician. I, I would ask um, Patrick and Jeff to address that question. <laughs> <laughs> so it, no, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very important question. It's something I'm, I'm um, frankly, I'm quite worried about. So um, within Odyssey, we're an open science community. That means everything we do before, during, and after is all placed in the public domain. We think very hard about how to communicate information as broadly as possible. I would assert that we are not doing a good job of actually making information truly accessible to patients. It is available to patients, but it is not accessible to patients. Um, uh, I, men I mentioned in my talk, and it's something that we're going to be talking a lot about at the Odyssey Symposium this year, just the simple idea of providing the world incidence rates. So I just want to know how often do side effects happen for each drug. Um, actually, Rob Califf mentioned it very early on in, in his talk that you know one in 20 Google searches are basically people looking for that. And I don't know about you, but I've Googled for side effects all the time. And generally, like the top 10 links are garbage. Um, and, and even when you get to a quasi-credible source, you can't find the information you're looking for. And so we've been thinking a lot about how would we produce that kind of information to, for example, get it into the hands of someone like Rob at Google so they could put it in those little health boxes. However, it's really hard because even the best of practice in epidemiology right now to report out an incidence rate, you got to cobble through the literature and you don't know what an incidence rate versus a proportion or time at risk and all this stuff and your head starts spinning. So I think there's a real need, um, I would say in general, but I'll say specifically in pediatrics, there's a really, really high need for us to figure out a way to distill information down so that not just that it's available when we perform these analyses, but that it's, that it's communicated in a way that people can actually make use of it. Uh, and, and hopefully accessible in a way that when they're facing that high stressful situation that, that they, can, they can be at ease by the fact that they've been provided information and not just overwhelmed with more data. Uh, so uh, similar to what Patrick described, all of the, certainly all of the sentinel analyses are public. So the reports will be there. There's not interpretation, it's the data. Um, so FDA's made sure that every question will be, uh, the answers to those questions are posted. We post the code and we're trying, as a community, we're being much more transparent than I think we were 10 years ago. Um, and you know, I think Patrick's has done a lot for that. I think the way that FDA has, has said, I want every piece of code actually to be posted online. Uh, that we use and documented uh, has been a big deal and because we see the community starting to use it. But that doesn't mean the information is that easy to understand. Um, and we have a lot of work to do on the easy to understand information. And I guess part of it's who's using it. If it's a patient, boy, it's really hard to, to think through how you would communicate um, particular risks, I suppose, or even just information without much context around it. Um, but it's not actually that hard to get at, but it's hard to, to make useful. One more question, and um, we need to make it a little bit brief because we're running late. Thank you. This will be brief. Um, so I don't know 
uh, following up on that que that last question, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Texas blood spot ma massacre, but if you like, that's sort of a incidence of big data where there, the information I think wasn't uh, adequately informing the public and many people misunderstood it. And there is, I think the need for more education, not just on the value of the data, but what we're talking about so that people trust the process. That was a case where the blood spots used from uh, neonatal heel sticks was an analyzed for, used for a number of uh, different analyses. And when the information got out, there were a number of parents who had had children who were born in, in, in particular Texas and Minnesota where there were lawsuits filed, where there were complaints that this was research and their child was never, uh, they never had consent, they never had any sort of uh, knowledge even that the research was being conducted. It was all very appropriate according to human research protections regulations. However, the trust that was damaged in that process, and I think this goes back to some earlier comments someone else made, um, just had a huge impact and actually resulted in a federal law that caused a lot of challenges in terms of the, trying to figure out how to deal with the ethics of that. So I think you need to not just educate about the value of what comes from the big data, but also about these processes and that, because if we don't do that, we'll be in the same situation we are with the clinical trial data, where people don't trust going into clinical trials and things because of concerns about that. Thank you very much. Um, we're gonna take 15 minutes. Let's see, let's be back here at 320. Our next speaker is Dr. Mark Turner. He's a neonatologist at Liverpool Women's Hospital and the University of Liverpool. He is a convener of the European Pediatric Clinical Trials Research Infrastructure, co-director of the International Neonatal Consortium, and co-scientific coordinator of the European Commission-funded uh, network of Excellence, Global Research in Pediatrics, or GRIP. And he'll be talking to us um, about European perspectives on the use of big data and healthcare research. Dr. Turner. And thank you very much for the opportunity to come and, and learn. Uh, I confess I'm a practicing neonatologist. I was doing rounds last week and so can uh, attest to what Dr. Califf was saying about big data being something you wade through rather than something you, you use. Uh, so it's really good to come and learn um, from clever people that can do, can do sums. Um, I need to declare some interests. Um, the university gets some money. I don't see any of it, um, but I haven't done anything new for the past year or so. And I also chair the European Network for Pediatric Research at the European Medicines Agency. Again, all views are my own. What I want to summarize is that there is considerable energy and enthusiasm for work in Europe on big data, particularly with regard to healthcare research. And this depends on a complex context that provides opportunities and imposes constraints. A central feature in European approaches is, is privacy and the rights to the individual. And my impression is this, this does offer a contrast to what happens in the States. And I gather the word not to say here is Equifax, um, which the European approach in many ways has preempted, at least in the sense of having legislation in place that can deal with it, even if we can't, can't prevent it. Direct exchange of identifiable data may be difficult, but indirect um, uh, exchange through de-identified data, through enclaves and so forth, um, may, may well be possible. The situation is changing. It's very difficult to keep track. So I suggest that the pediatric community will benefit from consistent contact points within all these different communities that we're talking to. So what I want to summarize is the European context to illustrate what's possible what's not possible and offer some, some explanation. And then look at some of the approaches that people are taking in Europe at the international intergovernmental level, at the level of industry and through academics. And then I want to summarize by looking at the maturity of each of these approaches and, and their practical implications. So my next slide attempts to summarize the European context. 
Europe does have a motto. Here it is, expressed in 24 different official languages of the European Union. Um, no. Sorry, um, my slides have been affected by Brexit. Um. So what, what the slide shows is 24 different languages saying the same thing, and they're color-coded uh, according to the families of the languages, which indicates some degree of interoperability and mutual intelligibility, but not complete um, intelligibility. And we have 24 languages reflecting 28 national governments, and each of these has some similarities and, and some differences. So. Uh, this is imposed upon all the other issues that we've been talking about with, um, with, with big data. And of course, there is this, um, there's this big issue about, about privacy, which is rooted in, in what we do. So yeah, we have, we have expressed this in three different alphabets in uh, five or six different language groups, including one derived from Arabic. Um, but the, the European motto, um, for those of you who'd practice your Polish, um, is un united in diversity, which might be another way of expressing the concept of interoperability. So um, the European context, um, which is ex fantastically explained in the current slide. Um, <laughs> oh no, that is, that is not the European context. <laughs> This is, this is the next slide. Europe, Europe has not been taken over by Mr. and Mrs. Gates. Um, so, so there is some law which applies without question across the whole of the European Union, and that's embodied in, in regulations. There's some law which is suggested to each member state that they then interpret in their own way, and those are embodied in directives. And then some countries do something that they want to do, and each of these interacts with each other. On top of this, there is some shared practice, but not complete shared practice, that can be instituted by the European Union or by a bigger grouping that's less formal called the Council of Europe. And then there are freestanding actions um, undertaken by groups or individuals in the context of these European actions. I think it's important to be aware that there is a master plan. We do diversity, but we also do strategy. And the European Union has put forward these steps to leverage the potential of, of big data, looking to invest in ideas through a range of concepts, and for example, formalizing how public-private partnerships work and stimulating individual research projects through um, an umbrella funding scheme called Horizon 2020, which will become Framework Program 9 in due course. After we've solved all the problems of 2020, we'll move on. And then then there was infrastructure for a data-driven economy, and this is, is fairly deep infrastructure. Are there enough cables to send data back and forth? Can we have a, a 5G, 700 gigahertz um, mobile or cellular network so the cars don't crash into each other? Which actually becomes very useful for health data if your watch is sending data back and forth as well. And then there were guidelines on standards and uh, one-stop shops for open data, that sort of official government data, and then managing and mapping big data standards as part of building blocks. And then I think fundamental to the conversation is trust and security, and AJ and others have hinted at this. And actually, if we're to get buy-in from the clinical community, and even more essentially get buy-in from the parent and, and child community, then we need to make sure trust and security is, is clear. And so there are European data protection rules that some people are very proud of, and um, there are guidelines on um, secure data storage, and these are all based upon public consultations. And I'll mention one consultation that we all might like to contribute to in a sec. 
So there have been a number of uh, relevant EU activities, uh, building a European data economy, which led to a communication, grand thing, a communication in Europe. And this set forward a number of principles as to how we can do things. There's a strategy about the data-driven economy uh, and so on. And, and these are there to make sure the building blocks are present for people, people to use. And th this is very high level, but it does begin to constrain the choices people can make about, about data options and, and, and solutions. And then um, open data is, is very important in its, in its place. So there is this, this framework, which is then embodied in a digital single market, which aims to open up digital opportunities um, through a number of, of, of these actions. And doing this not just for health research, but for travel, for um, all sorts of things. So for example, everyone's very proud of the fact that you can now use your cell phone anywhere in Europe and you don't pay to ring home. So when I go to France or Germany, then I can ring home. But I can't ring a friend in France from Germany. That still costs money. So there are some, some subtleties. And there'll be a single set of EU rules on data protection and privacy come next year, which many people are extremely proud of. But as AJ and others have hinted at, this is going to ha impose significant burdens on people doing research. Presum presumably as a fair price for accessing the data that, that we all want to use. As I say, we're working towards um, high quality 5G and then to, to help p make people more familiar with, the, with data, then everything will be available online as you travel. Common cybersecurity laws and um, encouragement for governments to work together. Now, this is all underpinned by, by consultations. So there's one consultation that's open at the moment that, that regulators, companies, individuals might like to contribute to. And this is a public consultation on health and care in the digital single market. So what can we do to support cross-border access to the management of personal health data? What inconsistencies are there in, in how data is captured? that we can we can improve on is that is that working okay i'm awfully sorry my, my diction must be destroying the <laughs> sound system okay so um, we want to have a joint European exploitation, and again, this this does need to be to be coordinated. That somewhere the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations (EFPA) has said that there should be a government-based, a government-backed system for sharing data in a pre-competitive way that that helps pharmaceutical companies and regulators and and clinicians and families work together. But you can't have that cross-governmental, government-backed organisation unless these sorts of issues have been discussed and thrashed out in public. So I think it's, it's worth considering um, con responding to this consultation. We certainly responded to your consultation on the common rule because we think what happens in the States is quite important what happens in, in Europe. And it may be that you might like to think the other way around. And um, the, the inspectors are here. Um, members of the European Commission have arrived in the United States yesterday to inspect your data protection to, de 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 to determine whether European data can still come to the United States. Because that's, that's how, how we take it seriously. I think the model is it's like applying GCP but to everyday data. So just as you, in a clinical trial, you want to assure the quality of every aspect of the trial and make sure there's an auditable trail for, for data. So the European Community Commission wants to make sure that data that comes to the states can be audited in the same way as it would be in Europe. And if, if, um, if there's a fail, then that will have, have big implications. So I think you're perfectly within your rights to contribute to this consultation to make sure that we have a, a global approach 
So as I've mentioned FPA, um, we can begin to move on to the approaches that the pharma industry is taking. And this report by the RAND organization um, identified some building blocks that, that will help. We need collaboration and coordination, which relates to identifying interdependencies in, in value capture. And I think value capture, um, or who gets the money for collecting the data, is a, perhaps an elephant in the room, because um, each time I hear about a new way of collecting data or aggregating data, then as a site leader, I'm worried that other people are going to make me pay to pass on my data. And all these visualization techniques, is that, is that a value capture? And is that going to reduce the amount of money that comes to me to maintain the data in the first place? Or is there a, a money tree, as, as our politicians describe it? Um, th then public acceptability and engagement with, with health data, very important. Data protection regulation, which the European Union has embraced. And then quality interoperability and other technical considerations I think we've been touching on here and do need to be, to be expanded upon. And very importantly, the capacity of the workforce. Everyone needs to understand why data is collected, why it's protected, and, and how it's processed. Because we, we've managed to train our nurses not to talk about guinea pigs when we talk about research. And we need to train people that not every data uh, system is like Equifax or whichever else, which other, other example you want to give. That we do need to give people this balance, and it does involve training and, and education. So some of the examples that have been identified and are underway are the WHO's European Health Information Initiative. This is at the level of policy and allowing people to... So um, what, what is a birth, what is a death, and, and such like, which does vary quite a lot. The definition of a live birth, for example, differs quite a, quite a long way across, across Europe and has big impacts upon, upon perceptions of healthcare. Uh, another example is, is using an integrated electronic health record from Europe's primary care givers, what we in the UK call general practitioners, um, but have multiple other names across Europe. And they, they did come up with some, some projects that looked at integrating different ways of handling electronic health records to suggest how you could promote interoperability. The electronic health records for clinical research initiative uh, was a big collaboration that identified some techniques and it was a really good pilot study and has led to the establishment of a non-profit uh, that is now able to, to hold, the, hold the strands of, of these efforts. Other examples are the European Smart Open Services for European Patients pilot project. There's a theme emerging here of pilot projects and then using guidelines that apply in one country but could be, could be generalised and then looking at um, electronic medicines infrastructures to, to build data that can then be used um, to, in, in further developments. So each of these is an example of how the elements of the toolbox are being put together but we still need to integrate that toolbox and make sure it's globally interoperability, globally interoperable. Now, one positive force in, in, in European drug development is, is an enormous private-public partnership, more than three billion euro, which um, must be a similar number of dollars, which represents funding from the European Commission, so this is European tax dollars or euros um, melded with in-kind contributions from the, the trade organization. And these, these come together and uh, come up with a range of projects. Many of them are condition specific, but some of them are building infrastructure. And so the IMI2 or IMI approach is to have this approach to big data for better outcomes. And there's a number of components of this which um, look at standardised outcomes, high quality outcomes data, 
and then using data to improve the value of healthcare delivery and engaging with patients. And there's a number of projects that are open to, to tackle these, these pillars, which can also be represented here with a number of projects, each of which is addressing one, one, one part of the, of the pie. And we do need to, to bring people together to, to make the most of this. Now, everything I've mentioned so far it doesn't involve children. So now we need to turn a focus to, to children. And, and there are two approaches. One is to do everything twice uh, and duplicate effort. The other is to have bridging structures that work across all, this other, all these other approaches. And we've gone for the bridging approach. One of the IMI projects is the creation of a pan-European paediatric clinical trials network. And this is led by Janssen and, and Bayer. And uh, Hydron is, is the industry co-lead for this. And I'm one of the, the academic co-leads. And this is developing a collection of networks at national level and at specialty level, which are hoping to train sites, qualify sites, and, and deliver clinical trials through better design and better practices at site level. But one of the work packages it relates to data and may, hope, may, may help to bridge across these other initiatives, looking to monitor performance metrics, so trials relating to data, but also promoting shared definitions of terminology for collection and storage of, of clinical data and contributing to common uh, CRF definitions, for example, a common pediatric data dictionary. And there's a lot of work going on in many spaces, so we see this as a, as a bridge that glues all these together. So CDISC and all the rare disease ontologies and all these other groups have been in contact to design how this might work. So embedding some data standardization within the clinical trials, uh, which can then hopefully uh, be used for all the purposes that we've been hearing about and integrated with patient registries. And we're particularly conscious of the rare disease community who do all this every time they set up a, 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 new, residence, a, a new registry. So we need to try and have some commonality across, across all of that. Another strategy that we're fond of is, is research infrastructures. So we have the European Strategic Forum for Research Infrastructures has a roadmap. And this is an illustration of its current roadmap. Now, um, ah, here's the pointer. So there are a number of, um, of research infrastructures that deal with molecules through to through populations on this horizontal axis and move from health through disease on this vertical axis. And these look at imaging, they look at biobanking, they look at biomarkers, they look at animal work, they look at um, regulatory science, and, and they look at the implementation of clinical trials. And so we, we have this umbrella concept of a pediatric clinical trials research infrastructure, which may be embodied by the IMI2 project. And this is then able to, to feed into pediatrics but we're missing everything that is done to prepare the clinical trials. So we've just received funding to develop a business case to support the European Pediatric Translational Research Infrastructure, which will bridge across all the biobanking, animal work, and so on, to make sure that trials can be done by having children in mind all the way through the academic pipeline that the, the EU is setting up. And again, data needs to be um, central to that, so that we have common definitions and can be interoperable by design rather than afterwards. Other relevant activities include attempts to try and unify data across, across Europe. So here's one example, which is the European Patient Identity Management System, or UPID. And this is being used, for example, by the pediatric oncology community to give a, a patient passport so that long-term surveillance studies can be, can be facilitated by at least a, a common identifier that is unique to each patient. Then this is maybe the favorite bit for the pharmaceutical industry. I'm gonna talk about European law and the general data protection regulation that comes into force in 2018. Every coffee break so far this meeting, I've been bombarded by questions about this. So it, it's driven by the sort of scandal that, 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 that we see unfolding here because that happens all the time and there's a need for companies and anybody who uses data to have it 
to make sure it's justifiable and, and is protected. So the, it will be immediately applicable across all the EU countries from next year, but some aspects will, be will have enabling legislation at national level. So it is a potential recipe for chaos. It does put individuals and their rights at the centre of data protection, but just as we have 24 different ways of saying unity and diversity, so we have 28 different ways of, of perceiving of what the rights of the individual are when it comes to data. So it, we will need to have some workarounds that allow data to, to, to be used by multiple users. This may be people querying data in situ rather than transferring data. But th these sorts of um, approaches have been developed through some of these RMI2 projects, so can can be put into place. I think you can probably do most things as long as there's a clear justification, you're protecting individuals, and institutions and corporations are taking due regard to the responsibilities. All of which means you've got to spend quite a lot of money to do things that you might have been doing before. So to move to a conclusion, I'd... Um, give this scorecard of the maturity of, of European efforts to work with big data for, uh, for research in health. There are lots of good intentions. I'm afraid we, we score quite highly on good intentions. But there is a complexity that is partly structural because 28 countries are going to do things differently. Uh, but there's also um, some, some fragmentation. But it's organised. I like to think of constellations of consistency. It's not completely random, and neither is it completely organised. There's a state of entropy that will eventually um, uh, improve. At the moment, we're doing a lot of scoping. There have been a number of consultations. There have been lots of pilots. But so far, there's limited generalizability of principles or, or action. And I guess one of my hopes for this sort of discussion is to begin to look for things that we could generalise. Even if we can't actually do the generalisation, it's looking for subject headings to then think about for generalising. What, what, what are the bullet points for a plan for generalisability about everything we've been hearing about today and comparable efforts in, in the States? So given this um, organised fragmentation, my conclusion is that we need contact points to help steer us through <coughs> the... Um, this complexity, because people in Europe do know what's going on um, and can bridge you in, into that. Now, for people who can do fancy sums, I recommend the contact point through NSEP. Um, and for the rest of you, um, contact the doctors, nurses and patients through Emprima. So together, um, with slightly different targets, slightly different audiences, we can signpost and, and bring people together. And certainly for clinical drug development, um, our global paediatric research networks will, will be a very powerful way forward. And in Europe, we'd put that forward as a network under development by MI2. So let's interoperate. And um, I'll thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Turner. And um, the next person that's going to be talking is Dr. Shoko Sakine from um, the Pharmaceutical and Medical Devices Agency in Japan. And she is a reviewer in the Office of Safety 2 at Pharmaceuticals and Medical Devices Agency. She'll be talking with us about pharmaceutical and medical devices agencies' plans for use of big data in healthcare. Good afternoon. I'm Michio Sakiyama from the PMDA Pediatric Working Group. It's a pleasure to be here today. Sorry. 
My colleague, my colleague Shou Kouseki, and I are here to talk about the current situation and the future challenges of using big data in healthcare in Japan. This is the outline of our presentation. First, I'd like to introduce the PMDA and the framework of post-marketing safety measures in Japan. Next, I'll talk about the current situation of post-marketing data surveillance. Then, Shoko will talk about the future challenges in Japan. Now, let's start with the introduction of the PMDA. The Pharmaceuticals and Medical Devices Agency, PMDA, is a Japanese regulatory agency working together with the Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare, MHLW. The PMDA is an incorporated administrative agency with non-civil service status. Our obligation is to protect the public health by assuring safety, efficacy, and the quality of pharmaceuticals and medical devices. We conduct scientific reviews of marketing authorization applications of pharmaceuticals and medical devices and monitoring of their post-marketing safety. We are also responsible for providing relief compensation for sufferers from adverse drug reactions and infections due to pharmaceuticals or biological products. This graph shows the number of proportion of medicines whose pediatric dosages and administration were approved in Japan. The proportion of medicines approved for pediatrics in total shows an increasing trend compared to before. Next, I'd like to talk about the PMDA Pediatric Working Group. The PMDA has established a pediatric working group as one of the projects across multi-offices since November 2011. Currently, we have 22 members, including pediatricians, physicians, pharmacists, and scientists from the Office of New Drugs, Office of Safety, Office of Regulatory Science, and so on. Our tasks are encouraging industries and investigators to develop medicinal products for children, strengthening collaboration with foreign regulatory agencies for development of pediatric medicines, studying and organizing past reviews and cases of consultations, and exchanging views with domestic stakeholders, such as medical institutions and industry groups. Now I'd like to talk about the framework of post-marketing safety measures in Japan. This slide shows the framework. Here are three typical post-marketing safety measure systems. Adverse reaction and infectious disease reporting system and the re-examination system and early post-marketing phase vigilance. After new drugs go on the market to assure the quality, efficacy, and the safety of the drugs, firstly, early post-marketing phase vigilance and subsequently post-marketing surveillance are conducted. If necessary, post-marketing clinical trials are also conducted. As regular pharmacovigilance activities, pharmaceutical affairs law mandate pharmaceutical companies and medical personnel to report adverse drug reactions and occurrence of infectious disease suspected to be caused by the use of the drug concerned. The new drugs are re-examined from four to 10 years after the drugs are approved. Next, I'd like to explain the re-examination system in Japan in depth. The re-examination system for new drugs was introduced in 1980. It is aimed at reconfirmation of the clinical usefulness of drugs at the end of the predetermined period after approval. 
Through collecting information on the effectiveness and the safety of the drug during the period, the surveillance and the studies required for the examination applications must be performed in compliance with the GPSP, GCP, or GLP, depending on their objective. The timing when these drugs should be re-examined is designated by the MHLW at the time of their approval as new drugs. The re-examination period of drugs containing new active in ingredient is usually eight years, with a maximum of 10 years. The applications for re-examination are judged according to the following criteria, one, two, three. No change in approval, partial change in approval, or avoidance of approval. Next, I'd like to talk about conventional post-marketing surveillance in Japan. It is conducted for almost all drugs to collect efficacy and safety information under the real clinical use. If necessary, investigation on long-term treatment using children, geriatrics, and patients with renal or hepatic impairment, etc., are conducted. Confirm concern adverse reactions, unknown adverse reactions, and the factors considered influential to efficacy and the safety of the drugs are always corrected. All case surveillance is required when limited data is available at the time of approval, such as open products. Post-marketing surveillance is beneficial because it allows follow-up of specific safety information in real clinical use, and it is useful especially when pre-market data is limited, such as new molecular entities or orphan products. But the conventional post-marketing surveillance has several limitations. It is non-interventional, mostly uncontrolled, and it is difficult to collect lots of information because it's a burdensome task for medical experts and because it is cost prohibitive. We need other options for collecting data. Next, I'd like to introduce the Mihari project. Consequently, for further reinforcement and enhancement of safety measures, the PMDA has launched the Mihari project in 2009. This project is a medical information for risk assessment initiative and also called the Mihari project. Mihari means monitoring in Japanese. Following three steps were taken in the first five years. First step was ensuring accessibility to several kinds of electronic health information, for example, medical records, insurance claim data, and so on. Second step was evaluation of data characterization. Third step was data utilization for epidemiological studies and interpretation of study results. As I addressed, one reason why the Mihari project was studied is to strengthen drug safety measures in, Japan, in PMDA. Second reason is necessity of drug safety analysis using expanded data beyond spontaneous adverse drug reaction reports. So for establishment of the framework for drug safety analysis with secondary use of electronic health information, such as medical records and insurance claim data, the Mihari project has begun. Secondary use of electronic medical information for safety evaluation is expected to enable safety evaluation based on quantitative analysis, which has been difficult so far. It will also provide a faster and easier way of evaluation compared to collecting primary data from study planned and conducted just for the purpose. 
This slide shows the novel framework of PMDA's pharmacovigilance practice. We evaluate drug safety using electronic health information databases such as claims data and electronic medical records databases to complement traditional data sources such as spontaneous reports. The information is shared with the MHLW. Then the MHLW provides appropriate safety measures. EMDA has conducted some studies in the Mihari project. Through this project, we have been able to enhance signal detection of adverse reaction, risk assessment of onset of adverse events, conduct surveys on patterns of prescription, and also research the impact of safety measures. We provide timely updates on the PMDA website. Next, I will talk about our new approach, advanced review and consultation framework using an innovative assessment techniques. The patient-level clinical data is not required in new drug applications in Japan so far. However, in recent drug development, the use of data-based quantitative information, such as those using modeling and simulation methods, has been proactively promoted in the decision-making process. Under such circumstances, the PMDA recognizes the need for accumulating electronic study data, analyzing the data with advanced methods, and making use of the data in the process of its reviews and consultations. Electronic submission of study data for new drug applications has been studied since 2016. The use of such accumulated data is expected to reduce the workload of regulatory submission for sponsors, improve PMDA's evidence-based reviews and consultations, and lead to development of new guidelines which will eventually result in a rise in the success rate of drug development. In terms of safety measures, taking a cross-sectoral approach to data analysis is expected to select a more appropriate pediatric dosage and calculate the risk of medicine for pediatric use more accurately for which monitoring should be implemented intensively. Next, Shoko will talk about the future challenges. Now I'd like to talk about some recent efforts on exploring other options as future challenges. First, MeetNet initiative. In Japan, available electronic healthcare data sources are, for example, claim data and electronic medical record data. Claim data includes information on, of, on patient characteristics, prescriptions, medical procedures, and diagnoses. It is beneficial in terms of collecting information on all treatment covered by insurance and tracing them. However, in the claimed data information, there are limitations, uh, like no information about test result is included. Now, for post-marketing drug safety measures using electronic healthcare data, MHLW and PMDA is currently building a new network of electronic healthcare database called MeetNet. In this database, healthcare data from various sources will be covered including not only claim data, but also electronic medical record data. So it could be beneficial, especially in following the laboratory test result. 23 hospitals from 10 institutions are collaborating in this effort. It covers 4 million patients currently. Also, data are able to put, be put out almost in real time. Here's data categories in the MidNet system. 
hospital information data, which is health care, health insurance data, claim data, and diagnosis procedure combination data are included. Featured to include laboratory data. Including laboratory data is a feature of this database. So I'd like to explain how we maintain high quality data. When we checked sampling data at the introduction period, consistency of data between HIS and MidNet database was very low. So by comparing actual data of a hospital information system and number of data items and contents to confirm if the data transferred to database accurately, we operated quality control hospital by hospital. Currently, real-time data quality control are being performed. In the result, the MITNA database is now a verified high-quality reliability and the most advanced database in Japan. I will show you an example of MITNA pilot. Uh, codeine is used for pain relief and cough suppression and have possibility that codeine induces rare but serious side effects such as breathing problems. PMDA, US, USFDA, and EMA had issued a recommendation to restrict the use of codeine-containing medicines as pain relief and cough suppression for children under 12. During 2009, between 2015, 0.2% uh, 15, were prescribed for under 12 years old, old in Japan. It is confirmed by the MITNA database the possibility co case causing respiratory depression during administration of codeine containing pro products. This information was used as one of the reference when we changed the labeling. Now I will talk about clinical innovation network. Since cost of developing a new drug is rising over the world, recently new approaches for clinical study with disease registries have been highly interesting. In Japan, in view of these, inter integrating disease registries have been under development with the leadership of national centers for specialized medicine research. There are six of these national centers in Japan, and those studies are developed in cancer, psychiatric, children, and other ideas. Promotion of innovation through development of clinical innovation network is also mentioned in Japan Revitalization Strategy 2016. Quote, the government will promote development of clinical innovation networks, creating a network of disease registration system developed by the National Research Center for Advanced and Specialized Medical Care and Academic Scientists thereby improving the environment for efficient clinical development. This is registries have developed for a variety of purposes such as tracking patients' entry to clinical trial, post-marketing post data collection. These registries does not necessarily collect enough, enough information to suit those purposes. It is also difficult to find out where and what kind of registries exist because a variety of institutes manage registries by themselves. Therefore, to accelerate the use of disease registries and clinical net in network framework, offer one-stop service such as coordinate registry information based on the purpose and coordinate clinical trial or necessary. Here is a study framework to promote clinical innovation network. PMDA are working on discussion of review-related items. MHLW confirms policies and MED offer funding. National Center of Neurology and Psychiatry, Nagoya University, National Cancer Center, and the Japan Neurosurgical Society develop registry for various, various disease areas. These projects are connected to each other. 
By promoting CIM, it is expected that registries can be used as a control in clinical trials and post-marketing surveillance and evidence for safety measures. Lastly, pediatric medical information gathering system. This is a database specific to pediatric patients. The effort is under the data saved at the National Center of Child Health and Development. Information such as the username, drug information, laboratory test result, and interview information are gathered using this system from individual institutions participating in the network of JACHRI. It is a Japanese association of children's hospital and related institutions. Collected data may be shared, analyzed, and relevant data by, by outside institutions, including MHLW and PMDA. Since this system includes information on drug doses, the administration of drug and adverse reactions, it is expected, and it has safety measures such as real as clinical development. For example, comparison of adverse reaction with other drugs may become possible. Now I would like to conclude. Conventional methods to collect information have limitation. Recent effort on building or utilizing patient registries, electronic healthcare data, and pediatric pediatric medical information gathering system are expected to expand the measure of long-term safety evaluation. We will continue our effort to develop framework and utilize surveillance or study for enhanced safety data collection and evaluation. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, everyone who presented in this panel. Um, we're going to now have a panel discussion. I think there are a couple of people that were requested to join the panel. That would be great, that weren't speakers. thought I would join the group down here. <laughs> okay, so I should just say uh, to start that this is not my specialty. I am here to learn. So you all can teach me something on international big data. Um, I'm going to start with question number one. What are the steps we need to take to set up international big data projects in healthcare? So, such as ethical area, data protection area, any other areas? Mark, do you want to start? Great, thank you. So, so the gentleman first, I see. Um, <laughs> fair enough. Um, Minorities. <laughs> so um, I, I, I would like to start this by engaging with the people who are affected by the project, the participants, the children, young people, and the clinicians, and um, other people who will facilitate it. Because I hope we can, we can do this through a sort of quality by design approach and find out what's feasible, find out what's going to work before putting pen to paper or um, brain cell to brain cell. And it, it's all about what's possible, what's feasible. Ethics depends upon, depends upon the country and, and, and so forth. So I think as a as feasibility that's informed by, by everyone who's going to contribute is first. And then the next step, as I learned earlier on, is a really careful 
discussion about the design of the study. What's your exposures, what's your outcomes, all the other tiddly bits that get in the way, and then um, move on to ethics, data protection, and so forth. Then, of course, we need to grasp those those problems. In in Europe, there are hundreds of ethics committees. I think you might call them institutional review boards. And in the UK, for example, you can apply to one ethics committee, which gives you approval across the rest of the UK. In Italy, you need to apply to all 120 or however many there are. And this will be simplified for clinical trials with the passage of the clinical trials regulation, whenever that starts. Um, but there's still a lot of hard work to be done. We, we are working with the European network of research ethics committees to, to point out that by protecting people in 120 different ways, you're actually not protecting them at all. You're, you're taking far more risks with children's health by having 120 ethics committees than you are by not doing the research. It's, it's crazy. But um, people are rooted in their experiences, and people have always done things for good reasons. The trouble is they've always done them for different good reasons. So we can't overcome that at one step. We just have to work through it step by step as the treacle gets ever thicker. So I'm afraid ethics committees in Europe are going to be a mess for the foreseeable future. Data protection is at least going to be very well regulated, and um, there'll be very clear rules to follow, and a significant overhead for anyone planning research. And that hasn't really filtered through into, into how it's going on. But grasping that overhead and, and working with it, uh, I think, is good. But I think the way around that overhead is to pool resources as much as possible, to build up these infrastructures that can be used for multiple studies. And certainly at the site level, for me, a, a child with oncology problems or cardiology problems still uses our database. Their, their billing or codes are all on the same, same computer system. So we need to make sure that computer system is interoperable with, with all the other ones. Some of the specialties have, have focused on, on their own registries, but I think we do need to supplement that by, by site level and, and national level, level data. So I guess my steps are to listen to people of all shapes and sizes, take a strategic approach to collaboration, and design the study carefully. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to just briefly say that Dr. Miriam Sturkenboom has joined this panel, and I haven't um, introduced her before. She's a professor in observational data analysis at Utrecht University Medical Center. Do, do you want to comment? Thank you. And um, yeah, thank you for the for inviting me. Yes, I would like to make a comment because. Um, I think actually we have already taken a lot of steps and um, as as we heard today from Mark, I mean, there are a lot of initiatives in Europe and there is, I mean, we have heard today so many initiatives as well as Odyssey already doing international data uh, projects, big data projects, but it, but it depends on the definition of what you call big data. I think if we, my learning is in the, in the EU, we always do international sharing because there's like 28 different versions, but so it's possible. It's also possible on the, in, in the vaccine area, there have recently been a lot of, um, you know, global projects actually fu funded by WHO where it's possible to actually share data uh, and do studies on vaccine safety. So it's actually possible to do this, even with the, you know, the differences in data protection rules across the world. It is possible if you use these distributed approaches, which it means that you leave the data where they are. So you send the analytics and then you get a sufficient table or, you know, just the data that you need, you get together in one place, which is then the safe haven. So you need to see where you send the data. Maybe we cannot send it to the US. We will hear that, as I understood today. But you need like one place that has a, a data protection rule. And when you send the data there, that is the rule that actually holds. So the choice of the country where you send the sufficient da data to is important. So I think we actually much further than we may want to believe from this question. Um, there is a lot of proof of concept that this works. Um, so I think, um, again, listening today to all these great data projects, what is needed as a first step 
would be is that there is a recognition, and I will talk about that tomorrow, that in the pediatric area, this is really needed, actually. So it's, you cannot, many questions you cannot address only in, you know, even not with the Sentinel or not with one of the systems. So what needs to happen is the, I think the realization that it's necessary to share data across continents, and I think we need to talk about continents here, um, and to make that happen. And, and so there needs to be the willingness, and I think that that is the most um, important step. Okay, great. Um, I would like to hear from our Japanese colleagues about your perspectives on maybe maybe Dr. Sakine. Okay, um, I'm not a specialist of the data uh, collecting, but uh, I think the 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 first step. Sh it, it, I think it is important to share what's the goal of the project because in uh, the, the I think the the rule rela related to this kind of uh, project is uh, complicated and must be different uh, between the country and country like a ethical uh, rule so the, to confirm what the, the it, I think it is important to share the, what's the goal of the project I think thank you Yes. I, I would just like to make one additional comment in terms of we talk about what are the steps we need to take to set up international data sharing. I would like us to consider from the word, from the, from the beginning, how to make these projects sustainable. Because we see multiple efforts worldwide on big data in, in various different spheres, but often they're not sustained. And so I think that, that should be a question right at the beginning. How are we going to ensure that this is sustainable so that the effort is not lost at every five-year funding cycle or whatever? Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Alison. That's, I mean, dear to our hearts in Europe, I think. Um, I think if you, I've been reflecting on this after the International Society of Pharmacopoeimiology meeting where we actually saw these, I mean, beautiful presentations about CNOTs and about Sentinel. Um, and I was wondering, having spent 10 years in Europe to try to put up similar initiatives and do projects in this distributed way, all of which, I mean, the technical part is not difficult, but indeed it doesn't stay there. So I think um, we need to take a learning from um, what happened differently in the US and in Canada. And I think what you see is those projects that have like a regulatory framework behind it or really like a governmental framework where it's law. I mean, actually they stay sustainable. And I think in Europe, I mean, we have a lot of taxpayer money going into all of the projects where things are done repeatedly and then they disappear after five years. So I think what would be needed in Europe is somehow a realization at the political level that, that there needs to be something that is kept sustainable. I don't think it's the responsibility of the project coordinators to make something sustainable because it's difficult when there is no framework behind it that actually supports that. So I would like to invite EMA and ECDC to actually go to the European Parliament, <laughs> or <laughs> Commission at least, to make that happen. I won't comment on that just now except to, except to agree that there is a very busy European landscape and if you look across the multiple initiatives there's a huge strength in depth but there also is that is also a limitation in that there's also duplication of effort and that is kind of a waste of money but it's a waste of learnings and, and, and that's what I think when we're thinking about how do we set up big international projects, we must really think about what would be the long-term business model in terms of ensuring the sustainability of the project. Okay, I'd like to go to question two. Thank you, everyone, about question one. Um, question two is what types of subject matter is possible to study using international big data in healthcare? <clears throat> And which terms or concepts can be included in big data research across jurisdictions? Are, are there limits to the subject matter that can be used using international big data? 
Go ahead. Um, I think the, um, I mean, the question is slightly, you, you can interpret it in different ways. So, so the way I interpret it, what is actually possible in an easier fashion to do across, um, uh, you know, m m um, internationally? And I think what we have seen is that um, if you go back, I think in the 80s we started already using big data for drug safety questions and the first starting in the US. And I think in the drug safety arena, I mean, there's basically no doubt that you need to use this type of big data to address the questions because the events are being so rare that you need to be big. Um, so I think in the safety, uh, drug safety, vaccine safety is where you can easily start. I think the difficulties that we're still facing are in the realm of comparative effectiveness, where you have most of the problems with confounding and all types of potential biases. So, so, so that is difficult, I think, if you have a um, scale. And then everything which is descriptive, I think, fits very well in the possibilities of what is possible. I, so I would start descriptive safety and then maybe when that is possible we go to effectiveness and then you can go even into machine learning where you know the where you need some guided approaches so okay thanks uh, I suppose the only thing I might add on that in terms of safety I was thinking about that in terms of what collaborations we were currently doing between the EMA and FDA and I guess safety is is difficult because it's so dependent on the clinical care pathway and how care is delivered. It's dependent on the access to medicines and, and that varies across different jurisdictions. And I guess it's also dependent on the preventative medicine, the preventative measures that may have been taken in different countries, what dosage, what co-medications are being prescribed and what other potential, there's multiple potential differences across different jurisdictions. So, so while we can study it, I think we need to be cognizant of, of the differences and, and it gets back again to really understanding the data sets. I suppose Patrick may be able to help in terms of what he's seen across the Odyssey network and how challenging that has been to look at different data sets in very different countries. Mark? Thank you. I guess I can suggest some terms or concepts that can be difficult to include in big data, just as examples. And as a neonatologist, I have to draw attention to the fact that neonate is not a standardized term. There's this unfortunate reliance on the WHO's epidemiological definition of someone who's less than 28 days old. But clinically, in Europe and the United States, and Japan at least, that's not a particularly useful clinical because it ignores prematurity. And so we are forced into calling someone who's day 29 not a neonate, even if they were born at 24 weeks gestation and they're clearly still immature. So that, that does need some, some resolution and ICH and other initiatives can, can help with that. A similar example is, is, is live birth, which varies considerably across different jurisdictions. And there's quite a big variation in the neonatal mortality rate in Europe, which people can interpret as variation in care but it's probably a variation in definition. And even fundamental things like, were you, were you alive when you were born? Um, these can vary in hidden ways. So I think it's well worth paying attention to what people actually mean by different terms and concepts. Would Dr. Sakiyama like to comment? Uh, uh, I talked with uh, Shoko about uh, this question. At that time, uh, we think, uh, for example, if uh, pediatric dose doses is different in each country, research of the outcome due to the difference of those doses and confirmation of the appropriate dose doses might be conducted, we think. Uh, but the, it, it is difficult because it depends on the circumstances of each country. Okay, thank you. Are there any comments from the audience or questions from the audience? Hi, Rushi Kamalaswaran. 
Um, I think it's an excellent topic of discussion and, and it has impacts for so many folks and so many domains. Um, one of the topics of interest that I personally have from a machine learning point of view is typically when we're talking of data and from an ML point of view, we want to have access to all the data. Um, but traditional methods require that you write down every single bit of data that you want. But if you're doing data exploration, especially if you want to do unsupervised learning or you know all of that, you ideally want the entire data set. And as soon as you mention that, there's a, there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, there's some pushback. How do you think, um, as we start to progress more and more into this domain of machine learning and unsupervised learning and exploratory uh, reinforced learning, how do you think internationally or even collaboratively, how do you think the protocols or procedures might, might, might be different or might change? Okay, no. Nope. Okay, good. Um, well, that's a very good question, uh, and I don't have an answer right away. I can just imagine how that may be, because I guess we have hurdles. First of all, uh, there is a hesitancy, I think, to completely embark on uh, machine learning for many people. And I've been working in the medical informatics department, so I know now what it means and how to do it. But I think, first of all, when you go to a medical community, or if you speak about health data, a lot of people may not know what it means and what you're doing. So I think the first hurdle is to convince people that what you're doing actually makes some sense. And um, there is also differences in terminology. So you'd speak about accuracy and precision, and we speak, of, I mean, epidemiologists speak about different, you know, so there's all these terminologies that differ already between these two realms or worlds. And I was quite impressed with your presentation, actually, where you really incorporate everything. but. My reality is that that is very different. So if you speak about ontologies and, you know, I mean, people already have, have left. Um, so first of all, I think we need to create a understanding of what is happening. And, and then I think if you then want to go to exploring all of the data that there is, that becomes problematic, I think. Um, I don't know yet how you would do the distributed learning um, if you would send like a machine learning script to the local sites. I think that that is that that can easily be implemented, but I don't know that people necessarily would trust the results if you do unsupervised learning. So that would be my reservation um, on this. But I think those are it's more the the governance and the perception hurdles that you need to take rather than the technical ones. Go ahead. No. Yeah, I no, I'm talking to you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Maybe first let me to question two. I, I would think as big, as we in industry do studies across all jurisdictions, so if, if we implement a pediatric protocol, it normally is implemented uh, the same protocol in Europe and, and in the United States and in more and more cases even in Japan. Uh, we use the same study protocol to study pediatric medicine. So I would think the limitation in big data lies more in the question and in the purpose where you would like to use the data for than in the jurisdiction when it comes to the scientific question. Different it might be with, with, with things like ethics and, and data protection laws that may pose a hurdle. But otherwise, I, I don't see the limit in the jurisdiction, I see the limit in the scientific question. Mm -hmm. um, come directly to that. Well, well, just one comment. I yeah. don't have a, I, I agree with you, but I think what we need to distinguish is uh, when you do a clinical trial, I mean, you do ask consent, and that legal legally is yeah. different from second, secondary use of big data where you do not have a consent, and that creates the problem usually. Yeah, and, and maybe that goes to back to, to my other comment I would make to the, to the first question. I think we, here we currently always talk as if all the data would be in, all have the same standards and all would be accessible in the same manner. But I think when we ask the question how we would implement a, a data protocol or, or this kind of big data project across all different countries, I think 
we have to start one step earlier, and that is what we addressing in Europe with the public-private partnerships. The hosts for this data are very different and employ very different uh, legal standards. You have academic data, which by definition have to be publicly available and accessible for further research. You may have uh, academic data which are covered by a patent, which are uh, proprietary. You have data hosted by medical agencies like the FDA or the EMA, which have different purposes on confidentiality. And you have a huge bunch of data hosted in industry, which have the next level of difference. And you have everything what is sitting in some kind of public hospital, whatever it looks like. And I think to start that, you have to bring all that stakeholders together, and they have to talk and figure out how they can share the data. And I think a, a nice model, maybe to be expanded somewhere on a global level under the roof of WHO or so, so maybe like SIAMS, something like that, is, is the IMI projects or the public-private partnerships we implement in Europe to do that. Because I don't think that any kind of the stakeholders can solve that problem on, on themselves. Thank you. I think we're going to actually go on um, to question three, since we have a limited amount of time. Um, do the European Medicines Agency and the Food and Drug Administration have any collaborations to collect data on post-marketing as well as pre-marketing phases of medical product development? This is. So I guess I should answer that. <laughs> yeah, if you don't so, mind taking it. So crack I um, I did do a bit of research on this to understand where our main collaborations lie, and I think it's true to say that the most formalised collaborations are in the pre-authorisation space, in that we have um, a quite well-developed EMA FDA paediatric cluster, but that also includes Health Canada, PDMA, and the and the Australian. <laughs> Um, agency, and that's been established since 2007. And within that consortia or cluster, they have monthly two to three hour teleconferences where they discuss issues that have arisen. And the, the thinking behind this is that avoids unnecessary duplication of effort, and it helps to understand the rationale for different approaches across the different agencies. And some of the things they discuss are the patient populations, especially if sponsors have suggested different, different patient populations across different regions, or potentially the timing of pediatric studies. And wherever possible, they aim for harmonization. And I think they've achieved something like 73% convergence of the, of the issues that they've addressed. And on some of these issues, they actually uh, release common commentaries, um, and they've had 25 in the last five years. And that gives informal, non-binding comments or advice for paediatric investigation plans under review by both agencies. And it's mostly on the initiative of the agencies, but, but the sponsor can request that. And equally, agencies have access to paediatric plans once they've been um, agreed, which enables discrepancies to be identified and helps to resolve those. So a lot of discussions in the pre-authorization phase, also a history of joint workshops and expert meetings and strategic meetings to discuss five-year visions about where could, um, where could harmonization be best achieved and how could paediatric medicines the um, development be best supported. And there are, of course, international consortia in the paediatric area, and the neonatal um, consortia is a, an excellent example of that, where uh, drug development is especially challenging. But I know the question was on post-marketing, and I think there, um, the, the, the predominant collaboration between EMA and FDA actually is with the monthly pharmacovigilance teleconferences that we have. And of course, any paediatric safety issue would be raised within, that conf uh, within those uh, discussions where it affected both jurisdictions, because it's not restricted 
to pediatric issues, but certainly they would be discussed there. And within that sort of those sort of collaborations, they also have quarterly um, pharmacovigilance clusters where they discuss strategic matters. And of course, that where those issues around pediatric safety issues could be raised there, as well as regular collaborations between the pediatric committees. So there is a lot of discussion, less sort of formalised as such. There's no specific pediatric cluster in the post-authorization space, but there's certainly a lot of um, collaboration and discussion. And uh, certainly, <clears throat> we've just released a new guideline on pharmacovigilance practices, and which includes some pediatric um, issues, and that's um, open for public consultation until October 13th. So I would encourage comments um, through, that, through that facility there. Our comments are really encouraged and welcomed on that. So I think... That's, that's it, actually, for me. Thank you. Uh, anyone else want to speak to this question, either in the panel or the audience? Well, I was just happy to learn that the PMDA as an agency takes the burden of uh, re remuneration for the public who suffer from the consequences of the actions. That seems to be a unique component of what the PMDA does versus what the other agencies have been doing. So in terms of uh, big data and collaborative efforts, I wonder what kind of governance gaps can be discussed if we're looking at this as an international community problem and not a country-specific problem. What does the panel think about that? So I'm not quite sure what you're getting at, but <laughs> I would say that wherever possible, harmonization of requirements is, of course, would be ideal. It's not always possible, but where we could have common agreement on specific requirements, then of, of course that would be ideal because it, it makes no sense to have completely different um, requirements across different jurisdictions, but that's not always possible. And there's different legislation driving the requirements in the different jurisdictions. Um, Dr. Jean Temick from FDA's Office of Pediatric Therapeutics. Um, our office helps to coordinate the monthly pediatric cluster teleconferences. That includes, as you said, Dr. Cave, EMA, PMDA, and Health Canada. I completely endorse everything that you said about the pediatric cluster, um, with one exception. Um, although we do predominantly focus on pre-market, we have in multiple occasions also discussed post-marketing issues, which are predominantly safety related to pediatrics. Because um, as you know, um, sometimes we do an accelerated approval, for example, and because it is a therapy uh, for a serious or life-threatening disease, for example, in children, and that we need to discuss with our regulatory colleagues in Europe, Japan, and Canada uh, what their thoughts are on what steps need to be taken to um, continue to monitor the efficacy as well as safety of the product in the post-marketing space, or an other example would be if, let's say, um, both EMA, um, Japan, and FDA have approved a product uh, for marketing, and then subsequently, when the product is on the market, safety concerns have arisen in the pediatric population, how we are then going to handle um, those particular safety concerns. For example, will we be adding warnings to the product labeling regarding use of the product in children, or additional risk uh, mitigation steps that need to be taken. So I just wanted to mention, although maybe some of those issues do come to the pharmacovigilance cluster, many times they also come to the pediatric cluster for discussion. Thank you, Dr. Temek. Um, I think if there's no one else that wants to speak to this question, why don't we go on to question number four. In the United States, how is long-term medical product safety data obtained? Through links, through uh, unique identifiers, for example. 
I think since I'm the only person from the United States on this panel, I'm going to have to take a crack at this one. Um, but I'm going to definitely ask the audience to also weigh in. Um, <clears throat> there are a couple of reasons why this is very difficult in the United States. One of them is that we have no unique identifiers beyond protected personal information. So that it's very difficult in, in a priv privacy-oriented uh, approach to have the unique identifier approach for collection of long-term data. Um, and the other thing, of course, is that we do not have one healthcare system so that the information that goes into s to the various different healthcare systems may not be valid over long periods of time. So one person might go from one healthcare system, two years later go to another healthcare system, the family takes them across the country. So it's actually very challenging to study long-term safety data or efficacy data in, in the, quote, big data realm. Um, in the United States for as far as long term. That's to date. Is it, but I'd be interested if anybody else has has comments to that. Um, Bill Cooper from Vanderbilt. I, I think one of the additional challenges, and Jeff touched on this in some of the vaccine work that he was describing this morning, is that when we've done long-term studies of drugs in adolescents, for example, trying to follow children after they go to, off to college, um, where they've moved states, so a, a study of death that could resolve on death certificates, we then have to go to the National Death Index and those kind of things. I think it goes back to thinking about these long-term studies, goes back to the same things that Patrick talked about in terms of thinking about what are we going to do to measure the clinical assessment and the patient impact? So it depends on that question when we think about those things. One of the one of the bigger challenges is as um, families change or they change insurance coverage, if we're using a claims-based approach, you'll often have difficulties in getting continuous data to know whether that you have continuous exposure, whether you have continuous measure of, of an important outcome. So it, it really, probably the long-term safety studies have to be really carefully thought through in terms of what exactly can you measure practically where you're going to get something that's useful. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, uh, sorry. Uh, just in the spirit of curiosity, is, is it possible to ask why the United States of America doesn't have a unique identifier? that doesn't rely on personal data? Is there a cultural thing or what, what, why? Because it, I mean, it's in the UK, it seems second nature, but that maybe that's me being odd. Mark, you have a single payer system. That helps. We also pay taxes, which is where the unique identifier comes from. And. We have Social Security, but that's separate from the the, the uh, healthcare system. I mean, that's one of the protected information. The problem you have, I mean, think about for the United States. You know, just recently the school year started. So what do I hear? I hear Walgreens advertising that they have a clinic where kids can get their school physical from. So that's you know another source of healthcare outside of the system. So you've got multiple touch points not all of which even are, are part of the system. Someone mentioned earlier the uh, school clinics, another part of the system. So it's, it's a very fragmented system. We don't have one single you know, national health system that can track everything across all those. C can I make a, a question about that? Because I think in, in, in many other countries, there's also not one single system, but actually the social security number is being utilized for linkages, I mean, that that is what is happening. So there is a, th that has been a solution in many of the European countries, as far as I know. Yeah. Is there something that is prohib? I mean. Well, that, that's, so if you look in surveys in the United States, um, and Pew has done this, 
um, the social security number is the number one number that people are concerned about having released. Now, ironically, Equifax may have solved that problem for us, but I'd like to open up uh, the floor for anybody that has any additional comments or questions. Patrick Ryan, uh, J&J. <clears throat> I would like to go back to a comment that Dr. Sakyama made that um, in Japan, the healthcare system is different, and so you might expect to see different doses or different behaviors between patients and providers. And I, I'd like to, uh, I guess, pose a challenge to the um, uh, to this uh, panel. It seems like that very reason is why we have to have an international collaboration. Because if we keep doing in the US just doing Sentinel, we're learning what we're doing in the United States, but it might be that there's something better to do that we could have learned if we had looked over in Japan or throughout Europe. So, so I recognize that there are challenges, but it seems to me the exact example you pointed out should, should serve as the motivation for why, despite all of these obstacles, we have a, a moral obligation to children that we need to learn across, across the world. So I just want to throw that challenge out and get people's reactions to it. Thanks, Patrick. Go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, Patrick, for putting this here. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think one of the nice examples that we have seen uh, from international collaborations, first of all, was about the pandemic. Um, and there was this international initiated by uh, uh, it was there was a study on the relationship between pandemic influenza vaccine and Guillain-Barré syndrome, which was stimulated by FDA and done together with WHO. And one of the things that what could be observed there is finally the comparison between adjuvanted vaccines and non-adjuvanted vaccines, because the U.S. was using non-adjuvanted, whereas in other parts of the world, people were having adjuvanted vaccines. So that is just a very simple comparison or example of what you are stating, that you can actually utilize the heterogeneity on an international level to learn more about the effects of drugs. Um, another example also in the vaccine arena uh, was this a global vaccine safety multi-country study that was just finished by WHO, uh, which was a proof of concept and using Sentinel sites in 16 different countries. And a lot of them were low and middle income countries. And basically because of the use of different strains of MMR vaccines uh, across the world, like com we could compare like different strains such used in Iran or produced, you know, Indian produced vaccines. and. So you have this sudden ability to actually compare the safety of the different strains of these vaccines, which otherwise would never be possible. So I think that there is a big promise, you know, to do these international studies. And not easy, but it can be done and it's quite educational. Does either Dr. Sakine or Dr. Sakiyama want to respond to what Dr. Ryan said? Uh, we don't have a specific comment, but I think uh, it, it, it is uh, really, uh, we, we should do some challenge to uh, do uh, such kind of study, I think. So I have a question for Patrick, actually. Oh, sorry. But, um, but just to say, when you run a study in Korea or UK or um, America, or you know, what are the differences you see, are there differences due to the region, or is it not? I'm not uh, vocalizing this very well, but you know, you have experience already of this with the Odyssey network. And how confident are you in the results that you get back across the different regions? Uh, so certainly, Miriam has more experience than I. But I'll comment from from my perspective. Uh, Every time we've done an international study, we've gained a tremendous insight that originally we thought was a problem that turned out to be something legitimate uh, every single time. So 
uh, when, we, when we looked at treatment pathways around the world, we noticed that for diabetes, everybody starts on first-line therapy of metformin except for in Japan. And we thought, okay, our Japanese data is problematic, but it turns out that no, in Japan, you don't necessarily start on metformin. Uh, you you in, the, in the UK, um, because of your tightly regulated formulary, uh, second line therapy is in, for diabetes is glycoside, which is a drug that's not even improved in the U.S. And why that's so notable is because, you know, myself as an epidemiologist, I rely on papers published at a CPRD to infer the treatment effects of diabetes treatments. And yet, basically, I'm referring on something that completely does not generalize to, to my country. And so we've seen many notable differences some of them might be data issues, some of them might be population differences, um, but many times it seems to actually come down to the, the course of the health system and, the, and the how care is processed, and those insights usually have, have meaning to themselves. And, and I guess the question for everybody will be the complexity of studies that can be done across different countries. So that's an example where prescribing is a relatively simple question, and how complex can you go with your study? And Miriam may. I want to let um, our colleague from Japan um, chime in here. Yeah, uh, I'm Junko Sato, uh, PMDA. I would like to support my colleagues. And based on our experience, uh, we require the Japanese clinical trial in Japan. If uh, sponsor would like to obtain, uh, obtain uh, Japanese approval. But because, because in past, we have a lot several experience. Exposure is different between uh, Caucasian and Japanese. Uh, I think uh, starting uh, for hyper, uh, hypercholesteremia is a good example. In US labeling, exposure is different and um, Exposure is twice in uh, Oriental, uh, based uh, compare with uh, Caucasian. So, such, based on such experience, we required Japanese clinical trial. But in parallel, we made lots of investigation with uh, academia, etc. So, in some situation, we can. Uh, yeah, so in some situation, we still have such difference between Caucasian and, and Japanese population. But in other situation, in some situation, we can accept uh, multi, clinical, uh, multi regional clinical trial. So recently, PMDA uh, encouraged to conduct the multi regional clinical trial to obtain uh, a Japanese indication Japanese regulatory approval. So, so it means, in the other words, recently the dosage is the uh, same with other countries, it means US, EU, EU. such a uh, product is increasing in Japan. So uh, maybe, maybe some, some uh, factor, the for example, body weight, the genetic difference still exist between Japan and other countries. But, but the, I think difference in, for example, 20 years ago and 30 years ago is getting small. So PMDA would like to uh, make collaboration with US, EU, other countries to to enhance uh, uh, drug development. So this is the current situation. And in past, yes, exactly, we request unique study, but now we are changing. So I would like to say that. Thank you. Thank you. I think we'll take one more comment. Um, from the panel, uh, and then I think we're going to stop for today because it's a little after five. So if I can, I would like to answer the question that Alison was posing is like, how complex can studies actually be? Um, and again, I go back to the vaccine area. And, and before I do that, actually, I would like to 
remind us that you know what we used to do was that everybody did his own study using a different protocol, using different definitions, et cetera, and then there would be somebody meta-analyzing that data and we would all believe it. That was our state of the art. I think we have made major leaps forward in that now we utilize a common protocol and in some areas, I mean, we're now moving into having common analytics, so we have the same analytics, and then we pull the data, and suddenly I'm, su I'm surprised because now people start discussing, can we actually pull the data? Whereas when we did meta-analysis, people were never wondering about that. So I think we have ma made major steps forward. Now, one example of how complex a study can be is, in my career, I think this was the most complex study that that I ever had to do, which is to address the question about the pandemic influenza vaccine and narcolepsy. I think that's an association that's really difficult. And um, it, it has been done on an international level in Europe. And then it now it is actually just finished on a global level. And I, Bruce Carlton was involved. I mean, many people from Taiwan, uh, we, the study was run in Taiwan, in Argentina, in Canada, and in European countries. And, um, it is possible using this distributed approach. It is actually possible to do it. And and personally, I have more confidence in in the results that you get when you have a common protocol and you have dedicated and you have similar analytics than when everybody would do his own study. So I think it's possible. It's not always easy, and you need to uh, remind what I think uh, we heard this morning also from Jeff, I mean, you know, you need to curate the data, really. If, the, if this is a, it's a sensitive question, you need to spend a lot of time in data curation. Okay, thank you so much to the audience and to the panel and to the panel from this morning. Thanks for a great day, thanks.